Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Rochester, Dennis Day, Bob Crosby, the Sportsman Quartet, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to take you back to New Year's Day. It's morning, and Jack Benny has just finished his breakfast. Do you want anything else, boss? No, no, that's enough. You know, I never feel like eating too much after a big night out. Oh, yeah, I forgot to ask you. What did you do on New Year's Eve? Well, I went to a nightclub where they gave you all the drinks and all the food you wanted for $6. All the food you wanted, eh? Yeah. Rochester, before you put my tuxedo away, take the lamb chops out of the pocket. (laughs) (laughs) Now, let's uh, let's get the table cleaned off, and I'll help you with the dishes. I don't want to be late for the Rose Bowl game. Okay. I'll do the dishes. No, no, Rochester, I'll do them. I want to try out that new electric dishwasher I got for Christmas. But, boss, there's something wrong with it. Nonsense. You probably don't know how to operate it. I'll show you how. Now, you put the dirty dishes in like this. And you close the door. Now, you turn on the switch. Yeah, da dee da dum ba bee da dum da dum bum bee da da dum da dum bum dee da da dum There, that ought to be enough. And now to take the dishes out, you open the door like this. <laughs> I told you, boss, there's something wrong with it. <laughs> Well, there shouldn't be. It's a new machine. I'm going to try it again. Get some more dishes out of the cupboard. But, but boss... Open the cupboard. Okay. What was that? Those are the dishes I washed yesterday. (laughs) Hmm. I can't understand what's wrong. Neither can I. Put it together the same day that I assembled the other kitchen appliances. Yeah, I don't see why it should break the dishes. Looks all right from the outside. Let's take a look on the inside, then. Oh, for heaven's sakes, Rochester. Look at the egg beater belongs on the mix master, not in the dishwasher. Then I must have put the part from the dishwasher in the mix master. Why? Oh, well, this morning I tried to mix a cake. When I turned on the switch, a big arm came out, grabbed me by the back of the neck, threw me in the bowl, and scrubbed me on both sides. (laughs) What? And before I knew it, I was sitting in the cupboard on a third shelf. (laughs) Gee, it even puts them away for you. (laughs) Rochester, call the appliance company and tell them to come out and fix the machine. I'll get the door. You finish the dishes. Coming, coming. Hello, Jack. Oh, hello, Bob. I thought you were going to the Rose Bowl game, too. Well, I am, but I decided to come by here to talk to you first. What about? I'd rather not talk about it here. Can we go in the den? Uh, Certainly, Bob. Follow me. Well, here we are. What is it you want to talk to me about? Close the door first, Jack, please. Okay. What is it, Bob? What is it? Mm, Would you mind closing the window? The window? Well, all right. And pull the shade down, too. (laughs) Bob, for heaven's sakes, what's the matter? What do you want to talk to me about? Jack, you've got to stop kidding me about the way that I say Manischewa the bits. That's not important. After all, it was just a little fluff. Bob, it's nothing to worry about. Well, I know, but you began kidding me about it, and my wife began teasing me, and she showed me how that all of our kids could pronounce it. Well, that's not... Wait a minute. Your youngest daughter's only seven months old. She can't even talk. Well, she still says it better than I do. (laughs) No. Yes, and it's not my fault, either. I tried to learn how to say it. I must have some sort of a mental block because I could never say it right. Well, look, Bob, let me help you. Don't worry about it. Let me help you. Now, let's break it up into syllables and work on it. Okay. 
Now look, repeat after me. Mana. Mana. Shevitz. Shevitz. Mana Shevitz. Mana Shevitz. <laughs> No, look, Bob, let, let's, let's try it again, Bob. Now, don't be nervous. Let's try it again. Now, try it. Mana. Mana. Shevitz. Shevitz. Mana Shevitz. Mana Shevitz. <laughs> Bob, look at once. I know you can get it. Now, let's try it again. Mana. Mana. Shevitz. Shevitz. Mana Shevitz. <laughs> Darn it, now you've got me doing it. Now, Bob, stop worrying about a little mistake. It's nothing. After all, your singing is the most important thing. Oh, now, wait a minute, Jack. I'm primarily known as a band leader, not a singer. What are you talking about? You have one of the best voices in the country. I'd be happy if I had the best voice in my family. <laughs> What? Well, I was second till Gary grew up. <laughs> oh. Say, Jack, I better be running along. You, you want me to give you a lift to the game? No, thanks, Bob. Rochester's going to drive me. Okay, see you later. I'll see you at the door. Oh, there's the phone. Well, you go answer it. I, I can walk to the door myself. Oh, yes, you're different from the other musicians. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you later, Bob. So long. So long. Hello? Hello, Jack. This is Don. Oh, hello, Don. I'm waiting for you. I'm afraid you'll have to go to the game without me, Jack. Why? What's wrong? Well, you know that new car, the MG, my wife gave me for Christmas? Oh, yes, Don. That, that little English car. Gee, it's certainly a sporty job. Eh? Yeah, I know, but it's been giving me trouble for the last three days. What's the matter? Can't you get it started? No, I can't get it off. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I feel like it. I feel like it. I feel like it. Teeny bit on that one. Now, Don, hurry over. We still have to pick up my new girlfriend, Iris. I want to take her to the game. Oh, Jack, I've been thinking it over, and I don't feel that I should go with you. But, Don, we were going to the game, and then we were going to come back to my house and have dinner together, make an evening of it. I know, Jack, but it'll be a better without me. After all, you know the old saying, two's company, three's a crowd. Well, Don, in your case, one... No, it's... <laughs> It's a new year. I won't say it. I won't say it. Well, I'll tell Iris. I'll tell Iris you couldn't come. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, Rochester. Rochester. Yes, boss? Uh, Mr. Wilson won't be here for dinner tonight. It'll be just the young lady and myself. Yes, sir. Now, Rochester, this young lady, this girlfriend of mine, has never had dinner at my house, and I'd like to impress her. Oh, don't worry, boss. The table is set beautifully. Flowers, and you eat by candlelight. Good, good. What'd you do about the champagne? Same as always. I took a cold bottle of Seven Up and slapped a mum's label on it. <laughs> what? And when you open it, I'll be behind the screen with my pop gun. Oh, good. Shall we synchronize our watches now? <laughs> okay, I've got 11, 17 and a half. Roger. Okay. I want everything to go off smoothly. Be I'll get it. You finish everything in the kitchen. Yes, sir. Coming, coming. Oh, hello, Dennis. On Wisconsin, on Wisconsin, plunge right through that line. Look, Dennis, Dennis, just, just come in the house. Yes, sir. Run that ball clear round the Rose Bowl, a touchdown sure this time. Dennis, on Dennis. On Wisconsin. Dennis. Uh, why are you singing Wisconsin song? Oh, I'm going to cheer for them today at the game. But why? Because I want Wisconsin to win. Why, Dennis, isn't that being a little disloyal? After all, you've been living here in Southern California for nearly 15 years. Living here, yes, but look where I was born. Oh, were you born in Wisconsin? No, New York. <laughs> Wait a minute, Dennis. This is the start of a new year. Don't make me mad. 
Okay, but say, Mr. Benny, if you like Southern California and I'm rooting for Wisconsin, maybe we could make a little bet. Well, all right, Dennis. How much would you like to bet? Two million dollars. Oh. oh, two million dollars, eh? Uh-huh. Well, Dennis, may I ask you something? Where in the world would you get two million dollars? I could borrow from the boys in the band. <laughs> oh, fine. I guess they have two million dollars. Uh-huh. And when, pray tell, did the boys in the band get two million dollars? A couple of years ago from someone named Brinks. <laughs> they did not. They weren't even in Boston at the time. But wait a minute. Remley was off that week. <laughs> no, no, they'd never, they'd never... They'd never stoop to robbery. Oh, no, you ought to see Bagby dressed up as an old woman. <laughs> Love, Dennis, please go to the game. Yes, sir. Well, goodbye. Bye. Oh, Rochester. Yes, boss? Uh, you better get the car out. I gotta pick up my girl, Iris. <laughs> Gee, Iris, I, I never saw you look so nice. You're sure pretty when you're all dolled up. This dress cost me 30 bucks. <laughs> well, it certainly looks nice. Boy, am I lucky I met you. You know, Iris, I never would have met you if I hadn't been hungry that night. I'll, I'll never forget. I was driving along looking for a place to eat and I drove right past Ciro's and the Macambo and it was, it was just fate that made me turn into Simon's drive-in. <laughs> and there, like a vision of loveliness, you came toward me. Gee, you smelled so good. Yeah, it was chicken gumbo night. Twenty-five cents a bowl, a meal in itself. Yeah, but I'm really the lucky one. Imagine me going out with a rich guy like you. A guy who, who can afford to wear a coat with a fur collar. Fur collar? Boss, it slipped off again. <laughs> Never mind, Rochester, and watch your driving. Look at that sign that says speed limit, 25 miles an hour. I got a wide open, but you'll never make it. <laughs> now, Rochester, drive up to the Rose Bowl entrance and let us off. Then you can park the car. Yes, sir. Come on, Iris. And hold my hand so we won't get separated. Tickets, tickets. Hold your own tickets, please. Here you are. Hello, Eddie. Hello, Iris. What's the special for tonight? Beef soup and boiled potatoes. Come on, Iris. Forget business for a while. <laughs> okay. Now, let's see. Our seats are in time. Hi, Jack. Oh, hello, Bob. So you know Iris, don't you? Sure. Say, Iris, are you still working at the Shamrock Cafe? No, I'm back at the drive-in. Jack thought I ought to be outside where it's healthier. <laughs> Darn right. What's the use of being in California if you can't enjoy the sun? Yeah, but I sure wish I could get off the night shift. <laughs> you will, honey. Just save your tips. That's all. I do, but every time I get a little ahead, you want to go to a movie or something. <laughs> well, it won't always be that way, you know. Hey, look who's here. Hi, Iris. Happy New Year. Same to you, Lefty. Lefty? Hmm. You know everybody, don't you? That's Lefty Flanagan. What a sport. He always orders a la carte. <laughs> well, don't talk to him. But Lefty's a big tipper. Oh, hi, Lefty. <laughs> now, let's see. Where... Well, come on, Iris. Let's get to our seats. Hey, Jack, I'll be right with you. I'm going to go get some programs. Okay, hurry up, Bob. Now, come on, Iris. Our seat should be in this aisle here. Stop, please. Let's see the numbers in your stubs. Here you are, Usher. Right this way, up this aisle, the row number. Oh, hello, Iris. 
Hello, Nick. How are things? Fine, I'm on parole now. <laughs> come on, come on, Iris, for heaven's sakes. Bob, let's get to our seats. Okay. Hey, here comes the band out on the field. Yeah. Say, say, these seats are okay, aren't they? They sure are. Yeah, we can see the whole field swell. Uh, pardon me, folks, pardon me. <laughs> huh? What do you think I ought to get my wife for Christmas? <laughs> Christmas? Mr. Christmas was a week ago. This is New Year's. You mean it's already 1949? <laughs> it's 1953. Oh, my goodness. I better get home. <laughs> now go home to your wife. Well, I can't because she's here at the Rose Bowl game. Have you seen her? For heaven's sake, I don't even know your wife. Now leave us alone. Okay. Hap! Happy New Year! <laughs> yeah, go, go already. Gee, it's a shame that a guy in that condition being allowed to get out. Yeah. Are you comfortable, Iris? Uh-huh. Only I'm a little hungry. Hungry? Uh, Say, if you want me to, I'll go get some hot dogs. Okay, go ahead, Bob. Bring three hot dogs. Okay, I'll be right back. What about mustard? I got some in my pocket. I came straight from work. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, Bob, just get the Frankfurter. Okay, I'll be right back. You know, Iris, I think this game will be one hey, of the... Pardon me, folks. Pardon me, folks. <laughs> oh, no, it's the happy time again. <laughs> what is it now? Have you seen my wife? Look, mister, I never saw your wife in my life. I don't know her. Now leave me alone. Okay, okay. Hap! Be there! <laughs> Gee, the people get me this football game. Yeah. If this wasn't going to be... Hey, look! Look, a guy just jumped out of a plane in a parachute. <laughs> hey, he's trying to land right here in the Rose Bowl. Of all the silly things to do, I wonder who would... Hello, Mr. Benny! <laughs> Dennis, be careful! What a crazy guy. Say, here I am with the hot dogs, kids. Oh, thanks, Bob. Yeah, thanks. Well, I just got back in time. Hey, look, there comes the USC team out on the field. Boy, oh, they're a husky bunch of guys. And just listen to that crowd. Hey, here they're coming right past us. Hello, Iris! <laughs> Iris, that settles it. I take you to a football game and you know everybody. Well, I can't help it. The boys on the USC football team always eat at the drive-in. They all like me. Well... In fact, they voted me Miss Unnecessary Roughness of 1952. I don't care what offer happens. Say, here comes that drunk again. Isn't that all? Say, pardon me, mister. Have you seen my wife? Look, I told you I don't even know. Hmm. Hey, Iris. Iris, watch me fix him. What did you say, mister? Have you seen my wife? Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, that's her sitting there two rows in front of us. The lady in the red hat. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry I'm late, sweetheart. What took you so long getting here? How do you like that? <laughs> Out of a hundred thousand people, I picked the right one. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, I'm glad you got rid of him so he won't bother us during the game. Say, Bob, you're really a rabid football fan, aren't you? I sure am. In fact, I'm so interested in the game that I'm writing a book based on the life of that all-American linebacker from UCLA. Well, what's the name of the book? I remember Muma. <laughs> Bob, that's one of the worst things. Hey, look, Jack, look, here comes the Wisconsin team. Say, those Wisconsin players look awfully good, too, don't they, Iris? They sure do. Hello, Iris! 
Well, that's the last straw. I'm leaving. I'm not even going to stay and see the game. Now, let me tell you something else, Iris. You and I are through. Our engagement is broken. Wait a minute. If you're breaking the engagement, what about the ring? I'm not giving it back to you. <laughs> Goodbye. Night, everybody. We're a little late. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Rochester, Dennis Day, Bob Crosby, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in just nine more days, a new tenant will move into the White House. And tonight, since we can't bring you the distinguished and lovable tenant, we bring you the mean old landlord, and here he is, Jack Benny! Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, that's the most ridiculous thing I ever heard, saying that I own the White House. But Jack, what I said isn't so ridiculous. Technically, as a citizen and taxpayer, you do own the White House. Look, Don. You own all the buildings in Washington. The Capitol, the Library of Congress. Don. The United States Post Office. Don. The United States Supreme Court. Don. The United States Mint. Don, stop it. What'd you say? What'd you say? <laughs> the Mint? What'd you say, Don? <laughs> I thought that'd get you, but Jack, it's true. You own it, I own it, all the taxpayers own it. It's like being a stockholder in a corporation. Well, Don, that's a very good comparison. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Don. Hi, Mary. Mary, I said hello, too. I know, I know. Well, what's eating you? Plenty. All I asked you is let me keep a couple of packages of meat in your deep freeze. And this morning, Rochester sent them back to me. He said there was no room. Well, Mary, if there's no room, there's no room. Well, now, now wait a minute, Jack. I happen to know that your freezer is unusually large. And just a week ago, I looked in, and it was empty. Well, it's full now. No kidding. What's he got in it? His Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's wrong with preserving a Christmas tree? Jack's right, Mary. It isn't any of our business what he keeps in his deep freeze as long as he has plenty of meat, like those steaks he served us last night. Some steak. What do you mean, some steak? If you didn't like it, why did you eat so much? I was trying to guess whether it was Dancer, Prancer, Donner, or Blitzen. <laughs> they were not reindeer. Those were very fine steaks. Didn't you see the government stamp on them? Grade A? Mine said Merry Christmas. <laughs> I wrote that on there myself. Now, look, Mary, we have a show to do tonight and a very important sketch. So let's... Start... <laughs> what in the world was... Bob! Bob, what happened? Well, Sammy, the drummer, he fell off the bandstand. What? Well, Jack, it isn't what you think. No? See, the boys in the band are just such practical jokers. Practical jokers? Why, what do they do? Well, they took the electric wire that goes to Remley's guitar and taped it to Sammy's chair. Well, of all things, wiring up his chair with electricity. I can't understand Sammy falling for it. Didn't he suspect anything when he sat on those wires? Well, he didn't even get suspicious when they slid his pants legs. <laughs> slit Sammy's pants leg? Yeah, they didn't have to shave his head. <laughs> that I know. But, Bob, I think the boys are going too far. Sammy could have gotten electrocuted. Oh, well, that's what the boys figured. So last night they took him to a cafeteria and told him to order anything he wanted. <laughs> Bob, you mean you went with him? Oh, no, Jack, no. Don't you remember I was at your house? Oh, yes, yes. Hey, by the way, what kind of steaks were those you served last night? Huh? Well, I went to bed, and every time I turned over, I heard sleigh bell. <laughs> now cut that out. I invite the whole gang over for a steak dinner. Instead of being grateful, you all make cracks about it being reindeer. The only one that hasn't is Dennis. I can't talk. I've got an antler stuck in my throat. <laughs> an antler? Your hat is still hanging on it. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake. I don't know why it is. I try to do a program and oh, every... Oh, Jack, Jack, take it easy. I can't help it. Dennis, why do you go around irritating people? I'm experimenting. What kind of experiment is that? Irritating people When you do it to oysters, they give pearls <laughs> <laughs> Now, 
Mary, you talk to him, will you? Dennis, you better sing your song. Okay. <laughs> that, uh, that was Dennis Day singing Heart and Soul. And very good, Dennis. It was excellent. And now, ladies and gentlemen, who can that be? Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny. This is Rochester. Rochester, I'm in the middle of a program. I know, but I want to tell you something. Tell me something. I just left the house a little while ago. Why do you always call me at the studio? I don't get applause at home. <laughs> Never mind that. What's so important? A man was here from a fan magazine. He said they wanted to print the story of your life. Pictures and everything. Oh, pictures too, huh? Yeah, so I gave him some that were taken when you were in the Navy. Some when you were in Vaudeville, and some that were taken when you were entertaining overseas. Oh, good, good. Uh, then he asked for one of your baby pictures, but I couldn't find any. Well, what did you do? I slipped him one of mine. <laughs> what? Uh, then he asked me a lot of personal questions. And I told him you were the nicest, kindest, and most considerate man I ever worked for. Well, thank you. Then he brought up the subject of your generosity. Uh-huh. So I told him for Christmas you gave me a bonus of $5,000. You told him I gave you $5,000? What made you think he'd believe that? Boss, when he didn't question the baby picture, I knew he was vulnerable. <laughs> Now, Rochester, I have to get back to the program, so I'll see you later. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, boss. What now? Uh, a few minutes after you left the house, an electric flute, the fuse blew out and your freezer went off. <laughs> an electric what blew out? A fuse. A fuse, huh? Uh, and my, uh... <laughs> your, your freezer went out. My freezer went off, uh, I see. Good. Well, what happened to all the things I have in it? Well, your Christmas tree is all right, but two snakes thawed out and ran up the chimney. <laughs> <laughs> ran up the... Now, that's ridiculous. Rochester, why did you make up a thing like that? Boss, when you start with applause, you've got to end with a laugh. <laughs> I hope I am as fortunate. Goodbye, Rochester. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Rochester may not be a good butler, but he's certainly... He's certainly... Hmm. Well, what's the matter, Jack? I wrote an ad lib in here, and I can't <laughs> find it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Well, Jack, uh, what about the important sketch you said we were going to do tonight? Oh, yes. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction tonight, we will present our version of that wonderful Paramount picture, The Road to Ballet, which stars Bob Hope, Bing Crosby, and Dorothy L'Amour. You know, I saw it last night, Jack, and it really is a funny picture. I know. Now, since I'm a comedian, I'll play Hope's part. And since Bob Crosby is Bing's brother, he'll play his part. And Dennis... Okay, but I look lousy in a sarong. <laughs> <laughs> look, you're not playing Dorothy L'Amour's part. You're going to be a native we met in the jungle. A headhunter. A headhunter? Yes, and before we start, go hunt for your own. <laughs> About time I had a joke in here anyway. <laughs> now, as a matter of fact, we were going to have Dorothy L'Amour on the show, but at the last minute, something happened. She wanted money. Oh, quiet. <laughs> now, Mary, you're going to be Dorothy L'Amour. Okay, but with Bing and Bob in the picture, who's going to get me? The May Company, if you keep making those cracks. <laughs> now we, that we've done all the casting, let's get on with our sketch. The Road to Ballet. Wait a minute, Jack. What about me? Oh, yes, Don. You've got a very important part. I have? Yes. Paint a white line down your back. You're going to be the road. <laughs> <laughs> and lie straight out. I don't want any detours. <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction of the evening, The Road to Ballet. My name is Bob Hope. <laughs> Bob Hope. 
My vaudeville partner, Bing Crosby, and I were stranded in Australia. We were broke and hungry and had no friends in Australia, so finally, in desperation, we became pickpockets. The first pocket I picked, nothing. The second pocket, nothing. The third pocket bit me. I had picked the pouch of a kangaroo. <laughs> After days of continued bad luck, we were walking down the street when I turned to my partner and said, Gosh, four days and nothing to eat. I'm starved. Say, Bing. When the blue of the night meets the gold of the day. <laughs> I knew there was something Bing could do that he couldn't. <laughs> Bing, I can't understand why I'm a failure. I'm a talented dancer. I'm a wonderful singer. I'm a great actor. I'm a big star. You're a big hand. Look, it's Bob Hope. Bob, Bob Hope, what a surprise. Some surprise. <laughs> we had three rehearsals. I turned down the first two scripts, finally had to call in my own writers, and he surprised. <laughs> Look, Bob, you can go home if you want. <laughs> I've got a monologue here that will run through Amos and Andy, Edgar Bergen, and right up to the weather report. <laughs> Weather report, dull today, funny tomorrow. <laughs> oh, yeah? Well, let me tell you something. Rochester may not be a good butler, but he certainly... Oh, my goodness, I wrote it on the wrong page. <laughs> now, Bob, I'd like you to say hello to the other... Uh-uh, uh-uh, just a second, Jack. Huh? A full minute has passed, and you haven't said it. Oh, yes. The road to Bally. That's better. <laughs> to say road to Bally. It's either that or money. Hiya, Mary. <laughs> Hello, Bob. Say, Bob, you know Bing's brother, of course. Oh, sure. Hello, Bob. Hello, Bob. How do you feel, Bob? Fine. How do you feel, Bob? Fine. How's your wife, Bob? Fine. How's your wife, Bob? Fine. How are your kids, Bob? Fine. How are your kids, Bob? Four writers got paid $6,000 for this sparkling dialogue. <laughs> Say, Bob, I meant to ask you, does Crosby here resemble his brother Bing much? I don't know. Let me see. Smile, Junior. Okay. Well, they look alike, but Bing is a little fatter on the wallet. <laughs> He's also a little fatter on the place where he carries his wallet. <laughs> Which reminds me, I'd like to ask you something, Junior. Well, what is it, Bob? I haven't seen Bing since Christmas. What did he give Santa Claus this year? What? <laughs> Bob, you know Bing. He doesn't splurge too much around Christmas time. He gives his biggest gifts on March 15th. Amen, Amen brother. <laughs> Say, Bob, how come you haven't seen Bing for such a long time? You're both at Paramount, aren't you? Yes, but they changed our dressing rooms and we're not next to each other anymore. I meant to tell you, Jack, they gave me your old dressing room. No. Really? Imagine that. My old dressing room. Gosh, I can still see... Still picture it. Start right oh, through God. anywhere through there. It's all fun. <laughs> That's what they did, Jack. What? No, that's old dressing room. I was okay in your line. I see. Well, you know, I can still see my old dressing room. There's a big landscape painting on one wall, a window on another wall, and what's on the third wall? Six wash basins. Now, Bob, let's get I won't talk until you look at your watch. Oh, yes, road to Bally, road to Bally. Gosh, two minutes go fast here. By the way, you haven't met Dennis Day yet. Huh? Hello, Mr. Hope. Oh, hello, Dennis. You know, I saw your very first road picture, the road to Singapore. Really? Yeah, and then I saw the road to Morocco, the road to Zanzibar, the road to Rio, the road to Utopia, and last night I saw the road to Bali. No kidding? Yeah, and now that I finally met you in person, I'd like to tell you something. What? You're nothing without Bing Crosby. <laughs> Why, you E-flat idiot. <laughs> I may... 
I may cut the strings off you and let you just dangle. <laughs> Is this fugitive from Glockamore sticking his tongue out at me? No, that's an antler. <laughs> Now, let's get on with the sketch. What sketch? The Road to Bally. Good. I got a free one that time. <laughs> I know, but I'm putting my watch ahead. Well, let's get on with the sketch. Okay. Hey, Jack, who's that lying down on the floor? That's Don Wilson. He's the road. <laughs> He's certainly got the bally for it. Say, Jack What? I couldn't think of anything to say then So I thought it was better to shut up <laughs> well, I was trying to think of a freeway line But I couldn't finish it either <laughs> What? Well, Jack Yes? I think it's only fair I think it's only fair for me to play the part I created in the picture Well, naturally So I'll play Bing's part No, Jack Since Bob here is Bing's brother He should play that role hmm. Well, what, what can I do in the sketch? Well, you play the part of the giant octopus now, wait a minute. I'm not playing any octopus. But it's a very important part. I don't care how important it is. Imagine a man of my position in show business playing an octopus. But, Jack, it motivates the whole picture. You see, the octopus guards a sunken treasure worth millions of dollars. Well, get me six more arms and let's go. <laughs> I'll set the scene. Ladies and gentlemen, Paramount Pictures presents The Road to Bally with Bing Crosby, Bob Hope, Dorothy L'Amour, and starring... The Octopus. <laughs> Curtain. Music. My name is Bob Hope. Crosby and I left Australia bound for the South Sea Islands to look for sunken treasure. We landed on the island of Vatu and became hopelessly lost in the jungle. For days, we wandered through a tangle of vines, and then we came to a rubber plantation, went through it for quite a stretch. <laughs> rubber stretch? <clears throat> if I'd known I was going to get dialogue like this, I'd have worn top hat and white tie. No pants. You got to get laughs, you know. <laughs> As we reached a clearing on the other side, we were surrounded by a fierce tribe of cannibals and their beautiful white princess. And my agent <laughs> The princess came up to me and said uh, Me native princess, who you? Oh, how do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Bob What's Cooking Hope Telling all you cannibals that while I'd like to bring you joy Don't look at me when you want to put something in the pot, boy <laughs> uh, No worry, my tribe not eat you You very handsome man Oh, wait a minute. You don't look like the real princess. Real princess not here. She want money. All I want is you, baby. Kiss me, toots. Hey, wait a minute, Dennis. You read my line. Oh, no, I didn't. Yes, you did. Look at the script. It says, Bob, that's me. It says, boob, that's me. <laughs> Some sketch this is. It's crazy enough to have Jerry Colonna in it. Ah, greetings, kids. How do you have me? <laughs> Wait a minute, you're not even in this sketch How can you make love to the princess? I don't ask questions, I just have fun <laughs> Hey, Bob, what about me? Beat it, Octopus, you come in later Oh well. <laughs> well, I'm getting out of here Come on, Bing When the blue of the night Meets the gold of the day our long trek through the jungle. Then our bad luck began. We had no food or supplies. At night, we had to light fires to keep the animals away. Then our water supply ran out. We had nothing to drink. We went three weeks without a bath. Then the animals started lighting fires to keep us away. <laughs> Finally, we came to the coast. We're looking down into the lagoon when the sunken treasure lay seven fathoms deep. We got into a boat and rowed to the exact spot. Well, this looks like the place. Don't you think so, Bing? When the blue of the night meets the gold of the day. <laughs> now, look, I'll put this diving helmet on you. There. 
Now go over the side and look for the treasure. Attaboy, Bing. Go down and get it. Here comes the giant octopus. That's me, folks. <laughs> oh, my goodness. The giant octopus ate up my pal Bing. Octopus, octopus, say something. When the blue of the night meets the gold of the day. Bob, I want to thank you for appearing on our show tonight and letting us do a parody on your picture, The Road to Valley. I'm glad to do it, Jack. Good night, Bob. Good night, Jack. So long, folks. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Rochester, Dennis Day, Bob Crosby, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, last night Jack Benny gave a party at his home. It's now the morning after, and we find Rochester with the aid of his boyfriend, Roy, cleaning up the house. I, I was too tired last night to get all these dishes, Roy. Yeah, there sure is a pile of them this time. Well, it was a pretty big affair. Now, let's finish these dishes. Uh, how many people were here last night? Nineteen. Well, that's funny. I only counted 18 dinner plates. Mr. Phil Ass was here, and he's not a food man. <laughs> Everybody was here. Mr. Benny's cast, writers, musicians. Or were his neighbors, Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman, here? No, they were invited, but they couldn't come. They both had colds. Well, isn't that unusual for both of them to have colds at the same time? No, they sat out in the rain all night to get them. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's go and clean up the living room. Okay. Uh, shall I dust off the piano? And the piano player, too. He's been there since New Year's Eve. <laughs> <laughs> now, Roy, you keep on with the dust, and I gotta look for something. Okay. Now, let's see. It ought to be around here somewhere. No, it's not under the chair. It's not behind the sofa, either. It's not in any of the corners. There, that takes care of the piano. Hmm. It's not under the coffee table. You know, Rochester, whenever I see Mr. Benny, he seems so dignified. How is he at a party? Does he ever let his hair down? What do you think I'm looking for? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we'll find it when we empty the vacuum cleaner uh, Good morning, Rochester Good morning, boss uh, Good morning, Mr. Benny Oh, hello, Roy Say, Rochester, wasn't that a swell party I gave last night? Yes, sir I thought the caviar was wonderful and the vichy soie just right uh, Boss The baked pheasant under glass was done to perfection uh, Boss I thought some of the guests preferred the breast of guinea hen. Boss, you can't fool Roy. He washed the dishes. <laughs> no. By the way, Roger, did Miss Livingston call? No, sir. Hmm, she said she would. I'm supposed to go to an auction with her. Well, she didn't. Uh, there weren't any calls at all. You mean Frank Remley didn't call up to apologize? No, sir. Hmm, I thought that by now he would have slept it off and called me. Well, maybe he's waiting for you to apologize to him. After all, he didn't want to leave the party. You made him go. Well, certainly I made him go. If I told Frankie once, I told him a thousand times. It's not funny when he grabs his guitar, jumps on Don Wilson's back, and yells, Look at me, I'm Roy Rogers. <laughs> It was embarrassing. Oh, it wasn't so bad. Not only that, but did you ever hear such lyrics to Mademoiselle from Armentier? <laughs> <laughs> I never heard such off. See who that is, will you, Rochester? Yes, sir. By the way, Roy, I really appreciate your coming over to help Rochester with the cleaning. Oh, that's all right. Rochester's my friend. I know, but I want to give you this money to show my appreciation. Well, thank you, Mr. Benny. You know, I'm out of a job, and it's hard for two people to get along on unemployment insurance. Two people? I didn't know you were married. I'm not. I have to keep lending money to Rochester. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't understand it. I pay Rochester a nice salary. What does he do with his money? Well, almost every year you go to England, 
And to celebrate, Rochester throws a little party here, which puts him in debt. Oh. So while I'm away, Rochester throws a party here. How long does the party last? That depends on how long you stay in England. <laughs> <laughs> the party lasts for two months? Plus six days if you come back by boat. <laughs> Look, Roy. Next time, why don't you fly back and join us? <laughs> hmm. I'll have to have a talk. Oh, Rochester, who was at the door? It was Dennis Day. He's waiting for you in the den. I wonder what he wants. Boss, I think Mr. Day wants to show his appreciation for being invited to your party. He's carrying a beautifully wrapped package that looks like a gift. Well, that's nice. I'll go talk to him. Gee, I wonder what Dennis could possibly have brought me. I always thought he was a silly kid, yet he's the only member of my cast to show his appreciation. Hello, Mr. Benny. Oh, hello, Dennis. Gee, it's nice of you to come over. Thank you. I just came by to tell you how much I enjoyed your party last night. I'm, I'm glad that you invited me. Well, you're certainly welcome, kid. By the way, Dennis, um, what have you got in that package? Oh, nothing. Oh, come on, kid. Don't be a tease. What's in the package? Nothing. Now, Dennis, the package is gift wrap, and it looks so pretty. What's in it? Nothing. All right. If you don't want to tell me, at least give me a hint. Well, it's something a famous person once wore. Something a famous person... Look, I'm no good at guessing games. What's in the package? Nothing. Oh, yeah, give me that package. I'm going to open it. Well, okay. Here. Hmm. Dennis, this package is empty. I know. Well, Dennis... Why in the world would you carry around an empty package? Well, that way, when somebody asks me what's in it, I can tell them the truth and still drive them nuts. <laughs> well, that's about the craziest thing I... Wait a minute. You told me that the package contains something that a famous person once wore. That's right. Who? Lady Godiva. <laughs> Try out my song now? Do anything. Just don't talk to me anymore. Okay. That kid drives me nuts. How'd you like my song, Mr. Benny? Aren't you going to talk to me, Mr. Benny? Gee, I'm sorry I got, mad, got you mad. I won't do it again. Gee, honest, I was only trying to have a little... Hello, Jack. Oh, hello, Mary. You're a little early. Come on in. No, you come on up for a minute, Jack. I want to show you something. Show me something? Yeah. Come on. What is it, Mary? Well, can't you see? Mary. Mary, that new car. Is it yours? Uh-huh. Gosh, Mary, what a beautiful convertible. Congratulations. Well, thanks. Gee, a, a car like that costs about $5,000. That's right. Wait a minute, Mary. How can you... Afford a car like this? Well, after all, Jack, I've been working for you for 20 years. I know. So last week I went out of the bank, drew out all the money I saved, bought a raffle ticket, and won the car. <laughs> Gosh. You see, Mary, I told you, stick with me and you'll do okay. <laughs> Boy, what a car. Uh, look, look how big the luggage compartment is. Gee, it certainly is roomy, and... Wait a minute, I don't see any spare tire. Well, the car didn't come with a spare tire. Well, of all the nerve. That's awful. What do you want me to do, go get my dollar back? <laughs> no, but next time you buy a raffle ticket, read it carefully. That way you won't get stuck. <laughs> hey, come here, Jack. I want to show you something else. Here, look at this. It's the latest thing. What is it? It's an automatic dimmer. When you're driving along at night and another car is coming toward you, their lights hit this little gadget and it automatically dims your lights. Gee, that's not so new. I've got the same thing. Jack, it's not the same thing. What? When another car passes your Maxwell, the wind blows your lights out. <laughs> it does not. <laughs> Let's go in the house. <laughs> And then we'll go, we'll go to the auction. Say, Mary, what is it you're so anxious to bid on over there? Oh, 
nothing in particular, but sometimes you can pick up some very nice antiques. Oh, well, let's go in. I'll get my coat. Okay. Oh, look, Mary, there, there's Mr. and Mrs. Coleman out on the porch. And Sherwood, their English butler, serving him tea. Oh, yes. Hello, Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Benita. <laughs> Hello, Sherwood. Hello, <laughs> I don't know why he had to catch a cold. He wasn't even invited. <laughs> Let's get in the house. Mary, when we get to that auction... Oh, hello, I... Mary. Oh, hello, Dennis. Jack, you didn't tell me Dennis was here. I know, I know. He's not speaking to me. Why, Dennis? What'd you do this time? I'll tell you what the silly kid did, Mary. Comes over here with a package under his arm that looks like a present for me, makes me waste my time guessing what's in it, then when he opens it, it's empty. <laughs> Dennis, shut up! Gee, Mr. Benny, I'm sorry I made you mad. So I guess it's no use. I, I better go. Goodbye, Mary. Bye, Dennis. Goodbye, Mr. Benny. Goodbye. That I'll say to you. <laughs> now go already. Oh, say, Dennis. What? I, I want you to offer my congratulations to your brother. I read in the paper that he's going to marry Anne Blythe. Yeah, that's right. But, Dennis, there's one thing that I don't understand. Your brother's name is McNulty and your name is Day. Why is that? Well, you know how it is, Mary. When you get into professional life, sometimes you change your name. Oh, so you changed yours. No, he changed his. He didn't want people to know I'm his brother. <laughs> Mary, it pays not to talk to her. <laughs> oh, stop, Jack. Uh, tell me, Dennis, when's the wedding? In a couple of months. Everybody's going to be invited. It's going to be a big wedding with ushers and bridesmaids and everything. Who's going to be the best man? My mother. <laughs> I had to talk to her. I had to talk to her. Mary, I told her not to talk to her. But I had to talk to her. <laughs> Dennis. I, you, I told you not to, didn't I? Wasn't I right? Huh? But I wouldn't listen to it, would I? Dennis. I don't know when to do my mind. Dennis, I think you better go. Yeah, okay. Goodbye. Just can't figure that kid out. Ireland itself is such a lovely place. I don't know why I invited him to my party anyway. Oh, uh, by the way, Jack, why wasn't Bob Crosby here last night? Oh, Bob? Oh, he's making a personal appearance at the Sahara Hotel in Las Vegas. Gee, I hope he calls me. Why? I gave him a quarter to put in the slot machine for me. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll probably hear from him, you know. Oh, Mr. Benny! Yes, Rochester? There was a phone call for you while you were outside. Who was it, Bob? Bob, 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 Bob Crosby? Bob? No, 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 was it Bob, Mr. Bob, Bob? Uh, Bob Crosby, Bob? Oh, uh, Mr. Wilson! Oh, Wilson. He, he wants you to call him right back. He's in Studio A at CBS. Okay, I will. Excuse me, Mary. So what if I lose the quarter? Who cares? Hello, CBS, the star's address. Oh, hello, Gertrude. This is Jack Benny. Will you please ring Studio A for me? It's busy right now. Will you hold on? Okay. Say, Mabel, what is it, Gertrude? It's Jack Benny on the line. Yeah, I wonder what the schmo of Kilimanjaro wants now. <laughs> he wants I should get him studio A, but it's busy. You know, Gertrude, I haven't seen Jackie since I was out with him and Mr. and Mrs. Jimmy Stewart on New Year's Eve. Yeah. But I don't know why he took you out instead of me. After all, he knows me longer. Say, that's right. You knew him before you came to CBS, didn't you? Certainly. I met him years ago at Ciro's. Uh, Ciro's? Were you the cigarette girl? No, I was parking cars. <laughs> Believe me, Mabel, you and Jack made a lovely couple New Year's. Only, you should wear your hair loose hanging down, not piled up on top of your head. Well, why? Well, um, with your ears, it looks like you're waving at somebody. <laughs> Look who's talking. I remember once at a masquerade party, you painted a face on each of your ears and came as the Andro sisters. <laughs> anyway, I 
think you're just jealous because Jack took me out on New Year's Eve. Why should I be jealous? I was with that big, handsome football player. Oh, yeah. You know, Goytude, I was kind of surprised to find out that he was still in high school. <laughs> so was I. Uh, he's old enough to go to college, ain't he? He must be. He's got a son at UCLA. <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> Come on, Jack, let's go. The auction starts at 2.30 sharp. Okay, let's get going. Gee, Mary, they sure seem to have a load of junk in these auction galleries. Don't they? Jack, it's not junk. Most of the things are valuable antiques. That's why so many people are here to bid on them. Hey, can I show you folks around? You still have a few minutes before the auction starts. Yes, I wish you would, but, but but you don't sound like the type of person I'd expect to find working here. Uh, you're right, lady. <laughs> See, I'm just here taking my brother's place. He's not here on account of jury duty. Oh, your brother's on a jury? No, the jury did its duty and gave him 20 years. <laughs> hmm. uh, tell me, clerk, what are all these rings in this glass case? Oh, them rings? Uh, well, they all figured in great romances in history. You see, the one at the center is the ring Mark Antony gave to Cleopatra when they got engaged. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, what's, what's the inscription on it? Oh, well, that's Latin. It says, Hoc Victor Semper Novitium. <laughs> what, uh, what is... What does it mean in English? Oh, you kid. <laughs> Gosh, imagine that. Say, what's this peculiar-looking thing? Oh, that's a very interesting piece of art. It, it's an umbrella stand made out of an elephant's leg. Well, that's the most ridiculous thing I ever heard of. Who in the world would want an elephant leg? A tree-legged elephant. <laughs> Well, you'll find very few of them bidding for it today. <laughs> An elephant leg. That's without a doubt the most useless thing I ever heard of. Elephant leg. Attention, please. Attention. Will you all please find seats? The auction is about to begin. Uh, uh, let's sit here, Jack. Okay. Now, the first item on the agenda is this unique umbrella stand made out of the leg of the favorite elephant of the Maharaja of Suti Juldi. Now, who will open the bidding on this priceless curio? I'll bid a hundred dollars. Mary, did you hear that? How could anyone, how could anyone bid a hundred dollars on that piece of junk? Jack, you don't like it, but some people do. Now, keep quiet. I have a hundred dollars. Do I hear more? A hundred and ten. A hundred and ten, that's stupid. All right, all right. By the way, Jack, I meant to tell you, I ran into Bob Hope last night. A hundred and ten, a hundred and ten, a hundred and ten. Do I hear more? Bob Hope, how is he? Fine, but he seemed a little upset that you hadn't sent him his check for appearing on your program last week. But Mary... A hundred and ten, a hundred and ten. Do I hear more? A hundred and fifteen. But Mary, I wasn't supposed to pay Hope for appearing on my show. We exchanged guest shots. A hundred and fifteen is bid. A hundred and fifteen is bid. Do I hear more? A hundred and twenty dollars. Well, Jack, Bob didn't understand it that way. He thought he was going to get paid his regular guest fee for going on your show. I'm bid 120 for this elephant's leg. 120, 120. Do I hear more? Well, Mary, what is Bob Hope's regular guest fee anyway? $5,000. $5,000? Sold to the man who just bid $5,000! Congratulations, sir. Here's your elephant leg. <laughs> May I have your check, please? Me? I didn't bid on that. I wouldn't pay $5,000 for an elephant's leg, would I, Mary? You wouldn't pay $5,000 for your own leg. <laughs> You're darn right I wouldn't. Come on, let's get out of here. Yes, I'm back, I'm back. Uh, what's that you're carrying? An elephant leg. <laughs> I got stuck with it at the auction. 
finally had to argue, and I had to give the man $130 for it. Here. Boss, what do you want me to do with it? Put it on and kick me. <laughs> Good night. Folks, not so soon. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Perry Livingston, Rochester, Dennis Day, Bob Crosby, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Let's go back to last Thursday. It's late morning at Jack's home in Beverly Hills. Hello? The telephone company? You want to install a phone here this afternoon? Are you sure you have the right address? Yes, this is 366 North Camden Drive, but there must be some mistake. Oh, the phone is for Rochester Van Jones. Well, let me find out about it, and I'll call you back. Goodbye. Hmm, I wonder why... Oh, Rochester! Rochester! Did you want me, boss? Yes, the, the telephone company just called. What's this about you ordering a phone in your name? Well, I figured it would be more convenient if we had two phones in the house. But that's silly. My phone should be enough. I talk on it very little. You can use it whenever you want to. I know, but I thought it might be a good idea to have another phone in case of emergency. But why? Suppose there is an emergency. You can use my phone. Yeah, but suppose the house is burning down and I haven't got any change. <laughs> Gee, I never thought of that. And besides, I'll be using the phone a lot from now on. It's the only way I'll be able to talk to my girlfriend, Susie. Why? What's wrong? Well, her father seems to have taken a dislike to me. But I thought you always got along so well with her family. What happened? And the other night, Susie and I were sitting in the dark on the sofa watching television when her father came in and got awful mad. Why should that make him mad? They ain't got a television set. <laughs> Oh, oh. Say, look what time it is. I'm going out the racetrack today, and Miss Livingston isn't here yet. Boss, you've got plenty of time. The first race doesn't go on until one o'clock. I know, but I go to the races so seldom, I don't want to be late. Oh, that must be Miss Livingston. Coming! Coming! Hello, Jack. Mary, you're late. Well, I'm sorry, Jack. I was leaving the house when I got a long-distance call from Mom and Papa. Oh, a phone call from your mother and father, huh? What did the bad and the beautiful have to say? <laughs> well, Mama said that Cousin Sylvia eloped last night. Sylvia? Mary? Mm hmm Gosh, it seems like only last summer I picked her up and bounced her on my knee. It was last summer. She's a midget. <laughs> oh, oh, so she got married, huh? Yeah, she married a man six feet two. No kidding. <laughs> Little Sylvia? Mm -hmm. Oh, but, Jack, a terrible thing happened. Right after the ceremony, as they turned to go back up the aisle, she took one step and broke her leg. How? She forgot she was standing on a box. <laughs> oh, that's awful. That must have been a sad wedding. Her mother was crying. Her father was crying. And I was All right, crying. all right. <laughs> I had to ask her how yet. Now, come on, Mary, let's go to the races. I got a hot tip in the sixth race, a horse named Our Fancy. Our Fancy? Yeah, and I hope I win. I can sure use the money. Why? You've never used any before. <laughs> Mary, stop that. Now, come on, let's get going. Uh, wait a minute, Jack. Isn't Dennis going with us? Well, certainly. Well, what are we supposed to do, pick him up? No, no, he's here. Dennis! Dennis, where are you? I'm in the kitchen. Well, come on, Mary's here, and we're ready to go. Okay. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Dennis. Dennis, we're all ready to... Dennis, what's that you've got on your head? A sandwich. <laughs> a sandwich on your head? Yeah, everybody in Washington is wearing them. Dennis, that's Hamburg, not Hamburg. <laughs> now, take it off. Okay. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Here I am, all set to go to the races, and I haven't got any money. 
I better go down to my vault and get some. I'll be back in a few minutes. Hmm. The rain must be leaking in somewhere. The moat is so full. <laughs> That's right, Ed. Glad to see you're looking so well. Thank you. How are things on the outside world? Oh, pretty exciting right now, Ed. We just inaugurated a new president. Uh, a new president? Yes. Gosh. I can still remember the words of the last one. Four score and seven <laughs> years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new... No, 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 Ed. We've had many presidents since then, you know. By the way, Ed, have I wished you a Merry Christmas? Yes, and I want to thank you for the Christmas present. It was just what I wanted. A camera. <laughs> you don't know how much I enjoy it. But, Ed, it's so dark down here. I can't understand why you'd want a camera. You can't take pictures. I know, but the click breaks the monotony. <laughs> oh. On New Year's Eve, I took a double exposure. <laughs> At midnight? Who knows? <laughs> well, excuse me, Ed. I've got to get some money. I'm going to open the safe. Now, let's see. The combination is right to 45, left to 60, back to 15, then left to 110. There. <laughs> well, I guess I'll take about fifty dollars. That'll be enough. <laughs> well, I gotta be going along now. So long, Ed. Goodbye, Mr. Benny. Oh, I almost forgot. Ed, since this is a new year, I brought you this Marilyn Monroe calendar. Here. Thanks. Gee, the colors are nice, but what is it? <laughs> well, I'll explain it to you some other time, Ed. I'm in a hurry. Just, just hang it up. Okay. Goodbye, Ed. Goodbye, Mr. Benny. I didn't have the heart to tell him, but he hung it upside down. <laughs> oh, well, I better hurry. Okay, kids, I'm ready. Let's go. Oh, Mr. Benny, while you were down the vault, the CBS uh, publicity department called. Uh, they want to know what kind of television show you're going to do this time. Oh, darn it. Now I'll have to call them back. Uh, no, you don't, Mr. Benny. I told them you were going to do a very classy show with a 60-piece symphony orchestra. A symphony orchestra, Jack? Yeah, oh, it'll be wonderful. You know, I even tried to get a world-famous pianist like, like Rubenstein. Oh, he'd be great. Yeah, he's almost as good as Liberace. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Now, come on, kids, let's go. Dennis, where's your hat? I ate it. I don't mean that. <laughs> All right, kids, I'll be ready in a minute. Oh, but Mr. Benny, don't you want to hear the song I'm going to do on the program? You listen to it, Mary, while I get the car out of the garage. Ladies and gentlemen, the fifth race was a photo finish. We'll have the results in a moment. Uh, Jack, when are you going to make your bet? 
You let five races go by already. I know. I'm only interested in the sixth race. Our fancy can't miss. Say, Mary, let's go get a... Oh, no. Look who's coming. That racetrack cow. <laughs> uh, where? Hiya, bud. Long time. <laughs> no see. Hello, hello. Come on, Mary. Let's get away from it. <laughs> Mary, let's go get a hot dog. Huh? But, Jack, we're in the clubhouse. Why not have lunch? Well, all right. Oh, waiter. Waiter. Yeah. <laughs> We'd like to get something to eat. What would you suggest? Another waiter. I can't stand you. <laughs> I don't care whether you can or not. Now, what can we get in a hurry? Well, we have roast pork, corned beef, leg of lamb, sirloin tips, and bacon and eggs. Mmm, bacon and eggs. That sounds good. Are the eggs fresh? Ooh, are they? <laughs> oh, well, I'll have that. How about you, Mary? Would you like bacon and eggs? Ooh, would I? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, just, uh, just bring us our orders, waiter, as quickly as you can. Uh, yes, sir, and I'll seat you at table number one. Uh, that's right over there. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, the last race was a photo finish, but you won't know the results till tomorrow. Yeah, that's strange. The picture turned out so good that we've decided to show it at your neighborhood theater. <laughs> now, Mary, let's look over the list of entries for the next race. I want to see if hey, the... Hey, Bud. Bud. Huh? Come here a minute. Me? Yeah. What is it? You gonna eat here? Yeah. What table? Table one. Uh-uh. <laughs> what? Take number nine. Well, look, I'm very happy with table one. Well, think it over, bud. Number one is a card table. A card table? Yeah. If it carries too much weight, its legs will fold. <laughs> Gee, I never thought of that. So you think I ought to take no, table number nine? Huh? Well, certainly. Look at the breeding. The breeding? It's by Bird's Eye Maple out of Grand Rapids. <laughs> Gosh, I didn't think they even knew each other. Get wise, bud. Think it over. Look, I'm not... Go Wait a minute. This is the first time I've run into you at a racetrack. Why don't you give me a tip on a horse? Who knows about horses? <laughs> what? So long, sucker. Hmm. Mary, Mary, have you figured out yet what You're horse... You're making an eggs already. I put them on table number one. Number one, do you think I'm a sucker? We'll eat at table number nine. Table nine? The shiny mahogany one? Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry, but you can't eat at that table. Why not? It was scratch. Now cut that off! <laughs> I don't know why you had to be our waiter. You make me sick. Well, you're not penicillin to me either. <laughs> Come on, Mary, we'll eat at the counter. Attention, please. We have a late change. Horse number seven, little lady, will not run in the next race. As she left the paddock, she broke a leg. I wonder how that happened. She forgot she was standing on a box. <laughs> How do you like that? The jockey was crying. <laughs> the serena was crying. When I was crying. Oh. <laughs> Come on. Come on, Mary. We'll eat at the counter. 
The horses for the sixth race are now in the paddock. Jack, are you still going to bet on our fancy? Well, of course. That horse will not only win the race today, he'll probably set a new track record. Uh, how much are you going to bet? I don't know. I wonder how much weight our fancy is carrying. I wonder who the jockey is. Jack, if you'd buy a 15-cent program, you'd know. <laughs> well, I don't have to buy a program. I'll go over to the information desk and find out. You wait here, Mary. Okay. Pardon me, mister, but how much weight is our fancy carrying? I don't know. <laughs> Well, what's the name of the jockey? I don't know <laughs> Well, how long's the race going to be? I don't know <laughs> Well, for heaven's sake, if you don't know anything about the races What are you doing behind that desk? I had to get behind something, I lost my pants <laughs> All the silly... Jack, Jack! What is it, Mary? <laughs> Did you get the information you wanted? No, darn it. I came to the track to bet on our fancy, and that's what I'm going to do. And Dennis... Yeah? This is your first time at the races, so take a tip from me. Put your money on our fancy. Our fancy? Let me see. That's uh, number eight. That's right. Well, that's not for me. I already bet on number 12. Number 12? What's the horse's name? Who cares about his name? It's the number that's important. That's my system. Dennis, you've got a system? Yeah, sure. Well, Dennis, according to your system, how come you bet on number 12? Well, the horse is carrying 116 pounds. He's running in the sixth race. So I added six to 116, which gave me 122. Mm -hmm. This is 1953. Nine and one is 10, plus five is 15, and three are 18. <laughs> I added 18 to 122, which makes 140. This is the fourth week of the month, so I divided four into 140, and that makes 35. Uh-huh. Then I subtracted my age, which is 26, and 26 from 35 leaves nine. Uh-huh. And then I added three and bet on number 12. <laughs> Wait a minute, Dennis. I followed you all the way down to nine. Why did you add three? Well, how else can you get to 12? <laughs> yeah, yeah, how else? Now, come on, let's go over to the $5 window and... Hey, Mary. Mary, look down there. Where? Down that aisle. Isn't that Mr. Paley? Oh, yeah. Well, come on. Let's go over and talk to him. Jack, he came to the track to enjoy himself. Now, leave him alone. But, Mary, I'm a big star on CBS, and he's the head of the network. If he knew I was here and didn't stop to say hello, he'd be heartbroken. Come on. Mr. Paley! Mr. Paley! Huh? Oh, hello, Jack. Hello, Mary. Hello, Mr. Paley. Say, Mr. Paley, what horse are you betting on in this... <laughs> on the track are the horses for the sixth race. Mr. Paley, have you picked your horse yet for the next race? Yes, Jack. I'm betting on Aviatrix. Well, look, Mr. Paley, forget about Aviatrix. Put your money on our fancy. He'll win by eight lengths. Well, Jack, my mind is made up. I'm going to play Aviatrix. But look, Mr. Paley, it's silly to come out here and just bet on any horse, especially after driving six hours to get to the track. In my car, it's 40 minutes. <laughs> Well, look, Mr. Paley, I've been studying these horses all season, and I know what I'm talking about. Our fancy can't lose. I'm sorry, Jack, but I'm going to bet on Aviatrix. Well, okay, Mr. Paley, it's your dough, but don't say I didn't tell you. The horses are nearing the starting gate. Well, I'm going up the window and make my bet. Five dollars on the nose. Say, uh, Mary. Uh, yes, Mr. Paley? I've been thinking if Jack is going to bet five dollars on a horse, he must know something. Mm. That's what I think. Yeah. I'm going to change my bet. I'm going to put $100 on our fancy. Well, Mr. Paley, would you do me a favor? Put $2 on our fancy for me. Okay, Mary. The horses are in the starting gate. Gee, I'm glad I got to the window in time. Now they're all lined up in the gate. They'll start as soon as they can quiet Silverado. He's dancing around a bit. So is Blue Reading. Gee, both of them dancing? <laughs> It takes two to tango. <laughs> what? And there they go. Oh, Mr. Paley, Mr. Paley, come on, the race is starting. Here I am, Mary. 
Going into the first turn, uh, it's Wild Glory in front, uh, a Colorado, a second, uh, a Silverado, a third, uh, a Aviation Pro, and a Black Hawk, and then the Red 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 Hawk,
Stanley Kramer to be here tonight. Jack, Stanley Kramer's a very important producer. Do you know him? Well, not personally. My agent arranged the whole thing. He'll be over after a while. Jack, I don't know if the background music will be the same as last time. Why not? You've got the same arrangement. Yeah, I know, but last week we added the pickle poop. <laughs> You say, you say you added a, a piccolo player to your band? That's right, and the fellas in the band are just wild about this boy. He's what they call a, a musician's musician. Well, what makes him so good? Well, besides playing the piccolo, he owns a liquor store. <laughs> a liquor store? Yeah, you ought to see the size of the case he carries that piccolo in. <laughs> Anyway, as far as the music is concerned, do the best you can. Hello, everybody. Hello, Mary. Give me a kiss. <laughs> Dennis, why'd you kiss me? Yes, Dennis. What's the matter with you? Oh, it's a bet I got with my girl. A bet? Yeah, I bet I could kiss every woman I saw today and I wouldn't get one slap in the face. Well, that's certainly an interesting bet. How are you doing? Three husbands punched me silly. <laughs> I thought so. One old man beat me with a cane. <laughs> Now, Dennis, I have a feeling... Can I go home now? No, you can't. <laughs> Dennis, we're doing high noon, and I want you to be on your best behavior because Stanley Kramer is going to watch us. Boy, am I anxious to meet him. What a tennis player. That's Jack Kramer. <laughs> For goodness sake, Dennis, don't you know anything? Oh, take it easy, Jack. What are you so excited about? I can't help it, Mary. He's such a stupid kid. How can anyone not know Stanley Kramer, the man who produced pictures like... The Champion, Home of the Brave, My Six Convicts, Member of the Wedding, The Happy Time. There isn't one other person in our whole business who doesn't know Stanley Kramer. I beg your pardon, but I... Look, mister, I don't know what you want, but you'll have to wait. <laughs> I'm trying to do a show here. I'm expecting one of the biggest producers in Hollywood, and you come in here and bother me. Who are you, anyway? Stanley Kramer. Oh. <laughs> Wait a minute, you... You're Stanley Kramer? Yes. He produced The Champion, The Home of the Brave, my six... I know what he's done. Oh, yes, <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, Mr. Kramer. Mr. Kramer, you know, for such a big producer, I was expecting a man more my age. You know, I mean, you seem so much younger. How old are you? I'm 39. Gee, I, I was sure you'd be younger. But what's the difference? You're, you're here, and I'm happy you can make it. Huh? Well, thanks, Jack. And frankly, I'm curious to see how you manage to transfer high noon to radio. You know, in preparing the subject for the screen, we were faced with the problem of presenting the complexities of a man fighting his own emotions. I know, Mr. Kramer. And you even employed a musical theme to crystallize the inner conflict of a man possessed of fierce pride and deep sense of duty coping with the dilemma of a newfound love. Well, that's true. Our hero was temporarily disoriented by a set of circumstances that juxtaposed turbulent pathological fear against the inherent urgings of an almost puritanical conscience. Well, I... Th oh, shut up! <laughs> I only wanted to say that I thought it was a wonderful picture. And you know, Mr. Kramer, in our radio version, I play the part of Gary Cooper. You do? Of course, I've added little touches of my own. Uh, by the way, Mr. Kramer, it just occurred to me that we might be able to get together on one of your future pictures. Well, thanks, Jack, but I've got all the financing I need. <laughs> I mean acting. Well, I'd like to use you, Jack, but you see, even though I've gotten away from it a few times, my policy has been the star unknown. Well, star Jack, he'll make you an unknown overnight. <laughs> Mary, for that remark, I... Oh, Jack, it's getting late. We'd better start our sketch. Okay. Oh, just sit down, Mr. Kramer, and I'm sure you will enjoy it. Thank you. You are welcome. Okay, Don, high noon. Take it. Ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction of the evening, we're going to present our version of that epic of the West, 
the Stanley Kramer production of High Noon. The time is the year 1875. The place, the little town of Hadleyville. The scene is in the office of the Justice of the Peace. I'm the town marshal, and my name is Gary Kane. This is my wedding day. Yep, right at this moment, I'm a getting married to my sweetheart, Amy. Do you, Amy, take this man, Gary, to be your lawful wedded husband? I do. Do you, Gary, take Amy for your lawful wedded wife? Yep. <laughs> now, repeat after me, Amy. Our Amy take thee, Gary, to love, honor, and cherish. Our Amy take thee, Gary, to love, honor, and cherish. Now you, Gary. I, Gary, take thee, Amy, to love, honor, and cherish. Our Gary take thee, Amy, to love, honor, and cherish. And with all my worldly goods are thee endowed. And with... <laughs> On, repeat it, and with all my worldly goods I thee endow. Ah, Gary, take thee, Amy, for love, honor, and <laughs> Just as I even had to buy the ring. I now pronounce you man and wife. Gary, my husband. Amy, my bride. Kiss me. Uh-uh-uh-uh, it's customary for the justice of the peace to get the first kiss. Stand aside, Amy. The man wants to kiss me. <laughs> Come on, Mary. Amy. <laughs> Mary is playing the part of Amy. Let's get going on our honeymoon. Gee, Gary, I'm so glad you're going to give up your job as marshal and put those awful guns away. Yes, Amy. Now we can have a peaceful life. And... Marshal! Marshal! Yeah, what's up? Terrible news. Frank Miller's been released from jail. No. Yeah, and he's arriving in town at high noon. High noon? <laughs> yes, high noon. And three of his henchmen are waiting at the railroad station to beat him. Where are my guns? And I better swear in some deputies. I gotta get Frank Miller before he gets me. Jerry, tell me, what's this all about? Amy, five years ago, I arrested Frank Miller and sent him to jail. He vowed he'd kill me when he got out. So I gotta get him first. But, Gary, you may be killed. I don't want to become a widow on my wedding day. I want to go on a honeymoon. Look, Amy, I can't run away. You wouldn't want to be married to a coward, would you? Well, I'd do anything to get out of the May Company. Because then I realized that Amy, spelled sideways, was May. <laughs> but I had my duty to perform, even if it meant losing Amy. I went outside. I walked the hot, dusty, deserted streets, looking in vain for men to serve as deputies. I went everywhere looking for deputies. I went to their homes, to the general store, and I went to the town saloon. In fact, we had a scene in the saloon, but we cut it because Phil Harris is on another network. <laughs> Finally, I went looking for desperate Dennis McNulty, a man who had been my assistant. Suddenly, I saw him. He came riding towards me. Oh, oh, easy now, easy, old paint. <laughs> I never had the heart to tell him. <laughs> he rode that cow everywhere. In fact, he was the man who originated the white line down the middle of the street. <laughs> he dismounted and said, Hi, 
Hey, Gary. Congratulations. I hear you just got married. That's right, I did. Who'd you marry? The school teacher? No way. They always do in westerns. <laughs> Look, I haven't time to talk about that. I'm in trouble, Frank. I'm in trouble. Frank Miller's coming back in town to kill me. <laughs> I need help. Oh. Also, a rehearsal. You sure do. Sure came to the right man. I'll help you. You will? Sure you're not afraid? Of course not. When I see Frank Miller, I'll sneak up behind him. Uh-huh. Then I'll stick my gun in his back and say, feet up. You mean hands up. No, feet up. Pat him on the popo. <laughs> Let's hear him laugh. <laughs> As I left him, he turned the cow over on its back and was milking it. <laughs> Looked like the fountain at Wilshire and Santa Monica. <laughs> I kept walking on through the town looking for help. The streets were deserted. It was getting close to high noon. And I had to find somebody to deputize. So I just kept walking, walking, walking. Time was running short. Still, I could find no one to help me. I was a marked man. No one would even come near me. This was before the days of chlorophyll. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. In my search for help, I wandered down to the Mexican Quarter. I came upon a group of people who were having a fiesta. Needing a deputy badly, I approached one of the men and said, Pardon me, senor, but do you know who I am? Si. <laughs> you know there's a man out to kill me? Si. Would you be willing to help me? Si. What's your name? Si. Si. Now you, you, senorita, are you a sister? Si. Is it all right for your brother to help me? Si. What's your name? Conchita Guadalupe Lolita Hernandez Gonzalez Carita del Prado Ramona Rosita Ramirez. Conchita Guadalupe Lolita Hernandez? Gonzalez Clarita Del Pedro Romano Rosita Ramirez? Sí. But that name is too long. What can I call you? Sue. Sue? Sí. But I was talking to her, wasn't I? Sí. What do you do for a living? So. So? San Cachita Guadalupe Lolita Hernandez, Gonzalez Clarita Del Prado Ramona Rosita Ramirez getting killed. It would drive the tombstone maker nuts. <laughs> now I had to make up my mind. I wasn't going to wait for Miller to come looking for me. I decided to go down to the railroad station and wait for him. I reached the railroad station. Frank Miller's train was due to arrive at high noon. With only a few minutes to wait, I went inside. I was alone in the station except for one cowboy. Thinking I could make him a deputy, I went over to talk to him. What's your name, partner? Tex Crosby. Tex, eh? Then you were born in Texas. No, I was born in Louisiana, but ain't nobody going to call me Louise. <laughs> That's an old joke. Well, it was new in 1875. Oh, yeah. What are you doing here anyway, Tex? Well, I'm waiting for Frank Miller to arrive. We're going to kill the town marshal. Oh, you are, eh? Well, I'm the town marshal, and I'm going to kill you. I got you, Tex. Oh, oh, oh. As he lay there, he reminded me of his brother. He was a groaner, too. 
Now I had gotten rid of one of the killers. The high noon train pulled into the station. We came to a stop. Frank Miller got off the very last car, was met by his two remaining henchmen. This was Maud Feet with destiny. I fell a lonely silence as I walked toward the three men who wanted to kill me. Alone in the blazing noonday sun with my hands on my gun. Slowly I kept a going towards him. Clumsy sound man got up and I continued walking. <laughs> My hands were sweating. My throat was dry. I knew that within one minute either they or I would be dead. As soon as I got within pistol range, I drew my gun and fired. Yep. I'd killed all three of them. Without giving them a chance to talk. This wasn't the way it was done in the picture. But I know how to save money on actors. <laughs> I was safe now. My only problem was whether to ask my wife to come back to me or go looking for Conchita Guadalupe, Lolita Hernandez, Gonzalez Tarita del Prado, Ramona Rosita Ramirez. But I and the whole town knew. It was high noon. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank Mr. Stanley Kramer for appearing on our program and also to congratulate him on the many wonderful pictures that he has produced. And one of the best of all is his latest production, Member of the Wedding, Starring Ethel Waters, Julie Harris, and Brandon DeWilde. Good night, folks. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Rochester, Dennis Day, Bob Crosby, the Sportsman Quartet, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we're doing our show from Palm Springs, California. And this year, hundreds of Hollywood's biggest stars have come here to get away. So now I bring you the man they thought they were getting away from, Jack Benny! <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking. And Don, it's certainly nice to be back in Palm Springs, isn't it? Yes, it is, Jack. It's a wonderful place. This is the 12th straight year you've come to Palm Springs, isn't it? That's right, Don. And you know, after all of these years, I still can't get used to it. The climate? No, the prices. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Don, I'm glad that you're enjoying yourself here. I sure am, Jack. But I've got a bone to pick with you. You walked right by me this afternoon. I waved to you, and you didn't even acknowledge my greeting. But, Don, I didn't see you this afternoon. Don't kid me, Jack. I was sitting right by the Park Lane swimming pool in a red and white striped bathing suit. A red and white striped... Don, was that you? I thought it was a beach umbrella. <laughs> those people... Those people sitting in your shade pooled me there. <laughs> Now, Jack, I resent the way you keep giving everyone the impression I'm fat. I've lost a lot of weight. In fact, I felt self-conscious because my bathing suit was so loose on me. No. Oh. Well, Don, maybe your bathing suit was loose on you, but the pool fit you like a glove. <laughs> Especially around the deep end, you know? <laughs> you look like... Hi, uh... Jack. Don. Hi, everybody. Well, hello, Hi. Bob. How are you? Hi, oh, Bob. Don. Hey, Don, didn't I see you at the Park Lane this afternoon? Oh, yes, you did. Oh, are you staying there too, Bob? Oh, no, Jack. I brought June and the kids up with me, so I rented one of those family bungalows on the edge of town. Oh, that's nice. I bet the kids are having a good time. Yeah, huh? but this morning we had a little excitement. Well, what happened? Well, Malia, our baby, she crawled away from the bungalow, and she'd gone two miles into the desert before we caught up with her. I wonder why she did that. Well, she thought she was in the sandbox that Uncle Bing gave her. <laughs> Yeah.
You know, Malia, she's a cute kid. You know, Bob, you've got five of the nicest children that I've ever met. Yeah, I guess so. What do you mean, you guess so? Yeah? Well, Jack, they're good children. They're well-behaved. They're smart in school and kind of their mother, dependable. They respect me, but... Uh... So what's wrong? Well, five kids and not one of them sings like Gary. <laughs> You mean none of your kids are talented? Well, Malia is. In fact, next week she starts out on a nightclub tour. A nightclub tour? What are you talking? She's only a baby. What can she do? Well, she cries like Johnny Ray. Oh! <laughs> By the way, Jack, where are you staying at the Biltmore? What? Bob, read that line over again, will you please? <laughs> oh, I, I see. Uh, By the way, Jack, where are you staying? At the Biltmore? That's better. <laughs> To him, it's nothing. But a comma can cost me $30 a day. <laughs> no, Bob, I'm not at the Biltmore. They didn't have a vacancy there. Well, where are you staying, Jack? Well, I'm at a little place just at the edge of town. It's called the El Pocho de La Salle. The El Pocho de La Salle? Yes, that's Spanish for don't let the sand get in your eyes. Don't let the cactus break your heart. <laughs> Very nice. You know, it's one of the... Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> uh, what were you fellas talking about? Well, Mary, we were just discussing a motel here in Palm Springs. Have you ever heard of the El Pocho de la Salle? The El Pocho de la Salle? Yes, Don, I know quite a few people who've stayed there. You see? I hear it's not bad if you don't mind taking the shots. <laughs> Yeah. Silly, you know, they find a few tsetse flies in the kitchen and the board of health gets all excited. <laughs> anyway, I like to stay there. They give you a room and your meals, you know, for $2 a day. For $2 a day, they give you meals and a room? Yeah. What about a bath? They insist on it. <laughs> they do not. They just make you run through the sprinklers. <laughs> Slowly. <laughs> Where are you stopping, Mary? Uh, at the Howard Manor. Oh, yes, I called you there today and you were out. I know, I was playing tennis over at the racket club. Oh, the racket club, eh? Yeah, and Mr. That May was, a great was there. Line, wasn't it? Oh, the racket <laughs> club, eh? I get all, those lines all through the show. You know what <laughs> What'd you say, Mary? I said Mr. May was there. Oh, you mean Tom May, the owner of the May Company? Yes, and I could have played tennis with him, too, if I just hadn't gotten so excited. Excited? What do you mean? Well, when he handed me the racket, I wrapped it up and was figuring the sales tax before I knew what I was doing. <laughs> well, how do you like that? But, Mary, if you're oh, going... Jack. Jack. What is it, Bob? Well, before I forget, the boys in the band wanted me to ask you if they can leave immediately after the show. Leave Pop Springs? Why, it's so nice and warm here. Well, that's what they're complaining about. What? Well, this desert sun is murder on those ice cubes. <laughs> Bob, you mean the boys are at it again? Well, on the contrary, Jack, they've been behaving. In fact, Remley was in bed at 9 o'clock last night. Remley? <laughs> Remley in bed by 9 o'clock? How come? Well, he was walking down Palm Canyon Drive. He saw the sign on the Chi Club, and he decided wait to minute, turn around. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Bob. It isn't the Chi Club. It's Chi Chi. Well, how do you like that? <laughs> Gee, Remley thought he was seeing double, and he went right to bed. <laughs> I tell you, it couldn't happen to a nicer guy. <laughs> oh, hello, Dennis. Oh, hello, Mr. Benny. <laughs> Gee, Mr. Benny, I'm sorry I'm late. Oh, that's all right, kid. Well, you don't have to get mad. <laughs> Dennis, I'm not mad. You came in a little late. That's the end of it. I tried to get you all afternoon and tell you I'd be a little late. You phoned my motel? Yeah, but I think the telephone wires were crossed. Oh. Every time I dial your number, I got the board of health. <laughs> well, if a tsetse fly answers, hang up. <laughs> board of health. Dennis, where were you this afternoon? Oh, I was out with a girl. Oh. Dennis, you've already been out with a girl? Well, that's pretty fast work. Oh, it's easy to find a girl in Palm Springs. Every store window in town is advertising them. Advertising what? Advertising dates. Oh, I see. <laughs> You don't need a joke. <laughs> Dennis, 
Those dates, those are the kind that come out of trees. Oh, no wonder her arms were so long. <laughs> no, no, Dennis. I'm talking about stuff dates. Mine ain't like a pig. <laughs> That kid drives me nuts. Oh, take it easy, Jack. I can't help it, Mary. I come to Palm Springs to get some sun, play some golf, have a nice rest, and that kid makes a wreck out of it. Say, Jack, I've been out on the golf course every day. I haven't seen you out there playing. I know. That would happen to me. I left Beverly Hills, forgot my golf clubs. You know what? I'm going to call Rochester and have him send them. Excuse me. Number, please. Oh, hello, operator. I'd like to place a call to Beverly Hills, California. Crestview 44124, please. Yes, sir. Who's calling, please? Jack Benny. Oh, Mr. Benny, I'm certainly glad you came to Palm Springs. Well, thank you. I hope you're planning to stay a long time. Uh, are you one of my fans? No, my father owns the El Pocho de La Salle. <laughs> What? Next time, take off your socks when you run through the sprinklers. <laughs> I will, I will. Now, get me the number, will you? And the circuits are busy. I'll ring you when I get your party. Thank you. Fresh operator. Dennis, while I'm waiting, you better sing your song, will okay. you? Okay. Uh, <clears> that was Dennis Day singing Even Now. And, Dennis, it was excellent. Well, thanks, Mr. Benny, and I'm sorry I made you nervous. That's all right, kid. It's just that I was out in the sun all day and my head hurts. Uh, your head hurts? Well, Dennis, do you see spots in front of your eyes? Uh-huh. Oh, my goodness. Maybe you're suffering from a sunstroke. Sunstroke? Certainly. I mean, how long have you been seeing these spots in front of your eyes? Next month, it'll be 22 years. <laughs> Dennis, sit down. You're just mad because I'm a better singer than you are. Well, that's the silliest thing I've ever heard. Certainly you're a better singer than I am. I'm a comedian. I'm funnier than you are, too. Oh, stop! <laughs> I don't know why I... I'll get it. That must be my call to Rochester. Hello? Is this Mr. Benny? Yes. I'm ringing your party in Beverly Hills. Thank you. Mr. Benny's residence star of stage, screen, radio, television, and it's getting hard to live with every day. Rochester! <laughs> Rochester, it's me. Oh, hello, boss. <coughs> Rochester, what's the matter? Well, the weather's been kind of chilly in Beverly Hills. <coughs> Wait a minute, are you hinting for me to let you come to Palm Springs? Either that or permission to turn on the heat. <laughs> what? The pilot light don't give off much. Now, Rochester, it's not going to do you any good to complain because you're not coming up here. You've got to stay home and take care of Polly, my parrot. She's got uh, a cold. I've been taking care of her. I gave her a hot toddy, but I think I put in too much whiskey. Why, what happened? She fell off the Persian when I went to pick her up. She took a swing at me. No. And, boss, nothing looks worse than a green parrot with red eyes. Well, give her an Alka-Seltzer. I did, and the bubbles keep knocking her off the perch again. <laughs> Well, look, Rochester, the reason I called, I want you to send me my golf bag and clubs. I returned it to Mr. and Mrs. Coleman. Well, where are the Coleman? In Palm Springs. Oh, well, then I'll get it myself. Where are the Coleman staying? I don't know, but they don't have to run through sprinklers. <laughs> well, I hope not. Who wants to play with a wet golf bag? Goodbye, Rochester. Goodbye. Oh, say, boss. Now what? Is Mr. Bing Crosby going to be on your radio program next week? Yeah, what about it? Well, let's plug it! Let's plug it! Plug it! Oh, yes, yes. Thank you, Rochester. Goodbye. Goodbye! Now, kids, I want you to keep Wednesday afternoon open because I'm going to make arrangements for us all to play golf together. If it's all the same to you, Jack, I'd rather not. You can count me out, too. Me, too. What about you, Dennis? You want to play golf with me? No, you cheat. <laughs> when did I... Oh, never mind. What's 
the matter with everybody here? Why does anybody want to play golf with me? Look, Jack, after that steak ride you arranged last night, you can't blame us. Why, that steak ride wasn't so bad. Oh, no? Well, I'm going to tell the audience what happened, and they can be the judge. Don't be silly, Mary. Nobody's interested. Oh, yes, they are. Ladies and gentlemen, oh. last night we all wanted to have some fun, and Jack made arrangements and insisted that the whole cast go on a steak ride with him. Hmm. It was about 7 o'clock when he arrived at the stage. <laughs> Now, come on, everybody. We'll get our horses. Over here, Don. Bob. We're with you, Jack. I didn't think you were there for a minute. <laughs> come along, Mary. I'll talk to that fellow over there about the horses. Oh, mister. Mister. Yeah. <laughs> Are you the one who takes care of the stable? Well, who do you think I am with this broom in my hand? An off-season witch? <laughs> Look, I'm Mr. Benny. I called up about a steak ride for this evening. Oh, yes. I have it written right here. Sixteen horses for a steak ride. Sixteen horses? But there are only fifteen of us. You're gonna eat, aren't you? <laughs> Look, don't be funny. If I want jokes, I'll call my writers. In which stable are they in? Now, cut that out. <laughs> and get a move on. We're anxious to get started. All right. What kind of a horse would you like? Oh, I don't care. Well, I've got a brown horse, a gray horse, a black horse, and a purple one with yellow polka dots. Well, that's silly. Who ever saw a purple horse with yellow polka dots? I did. Quiet, Remley. <laughs> Now, look, mister, we're not fussy about the horses, but get them ready, will you? All right, I'll be back in the gym. Jack, I've never been on a steak ride before. What do you do? Well, Don, this is my party, so nobody has to worry about a thing. I've arranged for us all to get horses here. I've got a guide who'll lead us through the desert and uh, to a beautiful little spot in the mountain. Really? And when we get there, I've arranged for some men to have a big fire going, and while the cook prepares dinner, we'll sit around the fire, sing songs, and then I've seen to it that you'll all get thick charcoal broiled steaks. Ah, uh, sounds wonderful, Jack. What happens after that? We all pay our share and go home. <laughs> you do not. <laughs> well, here he comes with the horses. Uh, here are the horses, Mr. Benny. Which one would you like? Well, I don't know. Uh, this one is a Palomino. <laughs> uh, this is a very gentle mare. <laughs> and this one is an English horse. An English horse? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll take this English horse. Help me up, will you? Be quiet, Cecil. <laughs> This is a big horse. It's sure high up here. Hey, Mary, this is fun, isn't it? Yeah, and I've got a beautiful horse. Look at mine, Mary. Did you ever see such a long mane? Put your glasses on. You're sitting backwards. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. We're all ready. All right, kids, let's go. Isn't it beautiful out here on the desert? Yeah, and the sky is so clear. And this trail is so nice. No ruts, no bumps, no stones. Well, you can thank Don. His horse's stomach is smoothing it out. <laughs> when Don rides... Oh! <clears throat> What's that? Well, it's either a coyote or somebody got his bill at the racket club. <laughs> Gee, coyotes and everything. I love riding out here. I should have been a cowboy. I'm an old cow hand from the Rio Grande. And your hair just fell down in the sand. <laughs> I'm a cowboy who never saw a cow. Never paid a bill cause you don't know how. <laughs> I sure ain't fixing to start it now. Yay, yay, yay. Say, Mr. Benny. If you like singing, I brought the Guadalajara Trio from the dollhouse along for entertainment. Oh, that's wonderful. Will they sing for us? Why, sure they will. <laughs> Gee, that, that was really 
wonderful. I'd like to thank the Guadalajara Trio. And you can talk to that fellow over there. He's in charge of them. Oh, oh, I see. Pardon me. Are you associated with the Guadalajara Trio? Si, sí, senor. <laughs> I am their part-time manager. Oh, just part-time. What do you do the rest of the time? Huh? I turn on the sprinklers at the El Pocho de la Song. <laughs> Well, that doesn't seem like much for a man to do. Huh? Earlier in the program, I was a horse. <laughs> a horse? <laughs> I think. <laughs> well, come on, kids. We better get going. You just killed the illusion. <laughs> Uh, when are we going to get to the camp, Jack? Yeah, we should have been there an hour ago. Hey, maybe we're going in the wrong direction. Yeah, what is this anyway? Maybe we're lost. I'm not. You're not? No, I still see the same spots in front of my eyes. <laughs> oh, boy. I wonder where we are anyway. I'll ride up and ask the guide. Let's see. There he is up on the horse in front. There. Uh, pardon me, uh, guy. How much longer until we get to the camp? I don't know. <laughs> Well, how much farther is it? I don't know. <laughs> well, are we going in the right direction? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know anything. Are you the guide? I'm a jockey. I made a wrong turn at Santa Anita. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake. Uh, Jack, did he say we were going in the right direction? He don't know. But if we stay, if we stay on the trail, we can't miss. Gee, kids, all we have to do now is build a fire. When we barbecue these steaks, you'll be glad you went on this trip. Oh, boy, look at those steaks. I can't wait till they're ready. Gee, they look wonderful. They sure do. Oh, boy. Well, I've got all the twigs and the wood and the paper and everything ready to make the fire. Who's got a match? 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 Don, Don, give him a match. I haven't got one, Jack. Mary, have you got a match? No. Bob? I ain't got one either. Holy smoke, what did we do? Wait a minute, Dennis, didn't I give you a book of matches? That was last Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, mister, you're responsible for the steak, right? It's up to you to have matches. Well, I always forget something. What? The last time I forgot the steaks. <laughs> So let's go home. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, next week we will also be broadcasting from Palm Springs and our guest star will be Bing Crosby. We felt that we should have something to brighten up the program and if Bing wears his usual shirt, that will do it. And also... Say, Jack, is my brother Bing really going to be on? Yes. Well, if he's going to sing a song, he'll have to change his style. He sounds too much like me. He'll change it. He'll change it. Good night, Paul. Broadcasting from the American Legion Hall in Palm Springs, California, the Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Rochester, Dennis Day, Bob Crosby, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I bring you a man who, after one week in Palm Springs, has become a picture of health. He was on the golf course Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, looking for the ball he lost on Monday. <laughs> and here he is, Jack Benny! Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking. And now, ladies and gentlemen, since this is our second week... Oh, wait a minute, Jack. Wait, wait a minute. Huh? Jack, did you really lose a golf ball? Certainly, Don. I even asked you to help me look for it all over the desert. And now, ladies and gentlemen, since this is our second week... Oh, in Jack, the... Jack, something tells me you tricked me. I tricked you? Yes. As we were coming past Roger's stable, you said, Don, you'll never find the ball that way. Stoop over. I did. You threw a saddle on me and for the rest of the day tried to rent me out for a dollar and a quarter an hour. <laughs> He found out. <laughs> I thought I was being subtle, too. You know, I can't... Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Hello, everybody. Mary, why didn't you show up for rehearsal this morning? Well, if you must know, for one thing, I was busy moving out of that hotel where you're living. 
But, Mary, I've stayed in that hotel for the last two weeks. It may be small and crowded, but it's a lovely place. Some lovely place. This morning, a guest balled me off for using the roller towel. Why? He was sleeping in it. <laughs> well, Mary, it's the height of the season. People have to sleep where they can. As a matter of fact, I happen to know that last night, some people had to sleep in the police station. Jack, that was the orchestra, and the height of the season had nothing to do with it. <laughs> Say, Barry, you're kidding about the orchestra being arrested, aren't you? No, I'm not, Don. Well, for heaven's sakes, what'd they do? I don't know about the others, but the police found Remley lying against the curb and he hadn't put a penny in the parking meter. <laughs> Mary, stop making up jokes. Now, you know the boys in the back. Oh, hello, Bob. Hiya, Jack. Hello, Mary. Hello, Bob. Well, Bob, are you still enjoying yourself here in Palm Springs? Oh, uh, pretty good. What do you mean, pretty good? You're living at one of the swankiest places in town, the El Mirador. That's right, Bob. And you know, during the war, the El Mirador was a hospital, but it isn't anymore. Well, I wish someone would tell the waiters. Why? <laughs> well, last night I ordered borscht. Borscht? Mm -hmm. Well, didn't it taste good? Who knows? They laid me on the table and shot it in my arm. <laughs> You're kidding. Kidding? Look at this muscle. It's a potato. <laughs> well, how do you like that? Huh? Then for dessert, they gave me an anesthetic. Well, Bob, that had nothing to do with the dinner. Everybody who lives at the El Mirador gets an anesthetic. Yeah, but why? That way they can give you the bill and you won't come to till you go through banning. <laughs> well, that, that explains a lot of things. That really explains a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> like what? Well, when I drove up to the place, a bellboy came out, carried in my wallet, and left my bags in the driveway. I'm sorry I took your line then, Bob. <laughs> Anything happens when you do that. I take his lines, he takes somebody else's. That's because we don't rehearse, you know. Well, anyway, at the, the El Mirador is really one of the nicest. Come in. Telegram from Mr. Jack Bunny. I'll take it, boy. Hey, here you are. Oh, just a minute, boy. Have you got change for a $5 bill? Change for a five? Yeah, I think so. Good, good. Here's the $5 bill. All uh, right, here's your change. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, boy, you can go now. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mr. Benny. Thank you. This is my lucky day. Uh, wait a minute, boy. What do you mean this is your lucky day? Mr. Benny gave you a $5 bill, and you gave him back five ones. What are you so happy about? When you do business with him and break even, it ain't bad. Of course not. Go already. Jack, who's the telegram from? Just a minute. I'll see. Hmm, it's from Dennis Day. It says, sorry, I can't be on the program today, so I'm sending a substitute singer to take my place. The reason I'm missing the program is because I'm eloping with Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> However, I'm silly enough to be back with you next week. <laughs> that crazy kid making up jokes for a telegram. It's six cents a word. It's ridiculous. Huh? Say, Jack, why did he say he's sending over a substitute? I can sing. Why, certainly, Bob. That's exactly what you're going to do. Any substitute that Dennis would send over would probably be some silly jerk who doesn't even know how to... Now, who can that be? Come in. Jack, look who it is! Bing Crosby! Well, Bing... Just call me substitute. <laughs> Bing, I'm surprised, actually amazed that you're the one that's taking Dennis's place today. Why, Jack? What's so amazing about that? Well, let's face it. How can a kid like Dennis afford to pay a big star like you for a guest appearance? Wait, wait, wait a minute, Jack. Dennis isn't paying me anything. The kid and I worked out an exchange deal. An exchange? Mm -hmm. I do a guest shot for him today, and he caddies for me tomorrow. <laughs> Well, Bing, I don't like to cast aspersions on your business ability, but I think Dennis got the best of you on the deal. Uh-uh. No, he didn't, Jack. You see, tomorrow I'm playing a match with Ben Hogan at $100 a hole. Wait a minute. You can't beat Ben Hogan. He's the best golfer in the country. That's what I want with Dennis. He'll drive Hogan nuts. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. There's oh. some writing. I got three O's in there. Huh? <laughs> Say, Bing, redundant. What? You know... Uh... I'm here. You know my whole gang, don't you? Oh, yes. Hi, fellas. And hello, Mary. Hello, Bing. 
Well, I guess I know everybody except... Uh, who's the fellow standing over there? I'm your brother. <laughs> I didn't recognize you. How are you, Robert? I'm fine, Bing. Gosh, I haven't seen you for months. In fact, not since I started working on Jack's program. See, no wonder I didn't recognize you, kid. You, you, you got a lot thinner. <laughs> Oh, wait a minute, Bing. If Bob lost any weight, it's not Jack's fault. Certainly not. Bob's working for peanuts, and peanuts are fattening. <laughs> well, thank you, Mary. You know, Bing, uh, it's quite a coincidence having you on the program. Only three weeks ago, we had your sidekick, Bob Hope, as a guest star. Oh, really? How, how was old Sickle Snoot? Hmm? <laughs> Sickle Snoot? Why do you call Hope that? Well, his nose looks like a bagel with one bite out of it, I think. <laughs> I think that's pretty yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> you know it does at that. Yeah. Say, Bing, right. uh, you and Bob Hope have made an awful lot of pictures together, haven't you? Yes, and don't hit that word awful so hard, will you? Just <laughs> kind of gloss that. Anyway, Beagle Beak is a little mad about it now because, you know, in every picture we make, I get the girl. Oh, is that what makes him mad? No, I get the money, too. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sakes, Bing, with everything else you have, why are you so interested in money? Believe me, you can't take it with you. They finally convinced you, huh? <laughs> well, almost. <laughs> Say, Bing, what are you doing down here in Palm Springs? Well, I've been doing some broadcasts, Marion. I've been uh, writing my autobiography. No kidding. Yeah, finally finished all the writing. I've titled it Call Me Lucky. Say, Bing, the story of your life must be very interesting. Tell me about it. Well, I was, uh, I was born in Tacoma, Washington, and... Uh, Oh, I tell you about it, Jack. You can read it in the Saturday Evening Post. Oh, yes, the Saturday Evening mm -hmm. Post, sure. That's only 15 cents. Comes in uh, eight installments. Oh, well, tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jack, <laughs> this, thing, <laughs> this thing starts in the February 14th edition of the Saturday Evening Post, and, and you can read it there. I know, but I want to hear the whole story at once. I don't want to wait eight weeks. Well, all right. You see, my life story starts off with my birth in the year 1914. 1914. Mm -hmm. See, this is 1953. 14 from 53. Hmm. That would make you 39. <laughs> Bing, you can't be 39. What's the matter? You got it patented or something? <laughs> no, it's just that, uh, that, uh... That finder's keeper. It is not. <laughs> Look, Bing, do you have a copy of your autobiography with you? Yeah, got it all right here, just as it appears in the post. Well, look, I'll tell you what. Suppose I read the story while you sing your song. Well, what makes you think he'll sing a song? What makes you think I won't? <laughs> <Let's go. laughs> Bingo, that was wonderful. And I just read your autobiography, and it's really interesting. Say, Jack, I've got an idea. What, Mary? Well, since we've got Bing with us, why don't we dramatize his life story? Say, that is a good idea. Look, Bing, suppose I do your life story on my show, then you can do the story of my life on your show. Your life on a half-hour program? <laughs> hmm? Don't worry, we'll work it out. Eight installments. <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, a special preview of the life of Bing Crosby as it appears in the Saturday Evening Post. <laughs> oh, excuse me a minute. Hello? I have a long-distance call from Mr. Jack Benny. This is Jack Benny speaking. I'll take the call. It's collect. Collect? Look, operator, I'm not taking any collect call. Just a moment. I'm sorry, Mr. Paley, but Mr. Benny said he isn't Mr. taking... Mr. Paley? Oh, my goodness, operator, certainly I'll take the call. Very well, Mr. Benny, go ahead. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny, this is Rochester. What? <laughs> Rochester, you tricked me. I had to, boss. I'm in the garage in San Bernardino, and I haven't got any money. The garage? Something wrong with my car again? Rochester, answer me. Is there something wrong with my car? Just a minute, boss. This is such a long story, I wrote it down. Never mind that. Just tell me what happened. Well, I was on my way down to Palm Springs to pick you up. Uh-huh. And as I was coming through Cucamonga, I was driving along the railroad tracks when suddenly I noticed the super chief was trying to pass me. Trying to pass you? <laughs> so I accepted the challenge, put my foot down to the floor, and would you believe it, for the next 22 miles, we were side by side. Rochester, how could you keep up with the super chief? The mail hook had me by the back of the neck. <laughs> Well, that's one way of keeping... Uh, one way of keeping up with it. Yeah, we were coming along at 90 miles an hour, and then it happened. What? We came to a tunnel. A tunnel? Oh, my goodness. Was the car wrecked? 
Boys, if you see four flying saucers with hubcaps, they're yours. <laughs> That's terrible. Rochester, are you hurt? No, I was protected by the ironing board. <laughs> Roger, you had the ironing board in the car? Why? If you found out I was just sitting there driving, you'd be awful mad. <laughs> I would not. Anyway, before you leave the garage, find out how much it'll cost to fix my car. Oh, I already did that. In fact, I had two fellas look at it, and they each gave me an estimate. The first said $17.50, and the second fellow wanted $800. Well, that's quite a difference. $800 out of the question for fixing up my car. What'll a fellow do for $17.50? Bury it! <laughs> At Rochester, you didn't really have a wreck, did you? Well, no, I didn't, boss. Then why did you make up such a story? Well, I knew I'd be late getting down to Palm Springs, so I started to make up an excuse, and it got away from me. <laughs> well, that's ridiculous. No, it isn't. I sold to the Saturday Evening Post in eight installments. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, boy. Now what? The director of your television show called, and he's already hired 700 dancing girls for your TV show next Sunday. Rochester, I'm not having 700 dancing girls on my television show next Sunday. Boss, you know that, and I know that, but let's lure the listeners. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Rochester. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, we present our dramatization of the Saturday Evening Post autobiography of Bing Crosby, Call Me Lucky, Curtain. In the city of Tacoma, Washington, the stork paid a visit to Mr. and Mrs. Harry Crosby in the year 1914, it says here. (laughs) The newborn baby was called Harry Lillis Crosby. Harry Lillis was a precocious baby and learned to speak quite young. At the age of three months, he said... Duh. <laughs> At the age of four months, he said, Da, da. <laughs> At five months, Da, da, da. And at six months. Da, 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 While other kids brought the teacher apples, he brought her Minute Maid orange juice. (laughs) Then at the age of seven, he received the nickname he made famous, Bing. It happened because his family lived next to a cherry orchard, and he was very fond of Bing cherries. Fortunately, he didn't live next to an orange grove, or today he might be known as Naval Crosby. This time, another blessed event took place in the Crosby home. The newcomer joined brothers Bing, Larry, Ted, and Everett, and he was named Robert. Bing took care of little Robert and tried to teach him to talk. Come on, Bobby. Say mama. Da. Come on, Bob. Say mama. Da. No, mama. Say mama. Mama. Shepherd of the lips. <laughs> That's how it started, folks. The boys grew up and began going to high school, and Mother Crosby thought Bing was old enough to have responsibilities, so she decided to give him an allowance of a dollar a week. When it came time for him to receive his first dollar, Bing said, Mother, may I have my allowance? Why, certainly, son. Here it is. Oh, but Mother, I'm supposed to get a dollar allowance. How come you only gave me 90 cents? Brother Everett gets 10%. (laughs) By now, Bing was attending high school, and one day on his way to class, he ran into his best friend, Robert Leslie Hope. Hope suggested they play hooky, which they did. They went down to the corner fruit store and swiped apples, and they went around tipping over ash cans and breaking windows. This was the start of their first picture, The Road to Reform School. (laughs) 
brother Bob shared the same room at Gonzaga University. They shared everything. They even took their Saturday night baths together. And they enjoyed it because it gave them a chance to harmonize. When he graduated from college, Bing's ambition was to become a singer. His career really started with an audition in Los Angeles. Your name is Harry Lewis Crosby? Yes, sir, but most people call me Bing. Tell me, have you made any phonograph records? Yes, sir. I've made lots of records. I made them for a company owned by Rudy Valley, but do I think he's jealous of me. Well, how can you say Rudy was jealous? He let you make the records, didn't he? Yeah, but he wouldn't put the holes in the middle. <laughs> You know, I like you. I'm going to give you a chance. Here, learn this song, and tomorrow night, you'll sing on a coast-to-coast -coast radio network. And the following night, for the first time in history, the rich baritone voice of Bing Crosby was heard as he sang... Crunchy munchies hit the spot from a cannon. They are shot. They will become your favorite dish. They are better than Cavill, fish. <laughs> way to success, and with fame and wealth, his interests became diversified. For instance, one day he witnessed the following scene. I'll buy that race horse. That's a very good horse you're buying, Mr. Crosby. Why, right, but tell me, uh, what does he go the mile in? Well, I don't know. He never quite made it. <laughs> well, look, Mr. Crosby, your horse can win its first race if you'll tell the jockey that's riding it to holler giddy app and throw this little electrical switch on the saddle. Oh, is, is there a battery under there? No, it turns on his hearing aid. <laughs> but Bing could afford a stable of slow horses. He had gone into pictures. His movie career was always successful, but it became more so because of three brilliant decisions. He made Going My Way, he made Bells of St. Mary's, and he turned down the horn blows at midnight. <laughs> His career really reached its zenith on a night in March in 1945 when he won the Academy Award. His acceptance speech was quite modest, as he said. I want to thank everyone who helped me win this Oscar. Even though I have supposedly reached the top as a singer, I want you to know that it has not been easy. I've had to overcome many hardships, poverty, disease, hunger... Como and Sinatra. <laughs> yes, Bing had reached the very top, and yet his fortunes grew and grew. He had records, television, movies, radio, frozen food, inventions, cattle, and oil wells. Yes, the world was his, and I wish he'd give it back already. <laughs> this is Bing's true story. <laughs> Bing, I want to thank you very much for taking Dennis Day's place on the program. I was glad to do it, Jack. Tell me, Bing, is Dennis really going to caddy for you when you play golf with Ben Hogan tomorrow? That's right. And you and Ben are playing for $100 a hole? Mm-hmm. Well, do you mind if I join you? You know, I'd like to pick up a little extra money. <laughs> what makes you think you'd win? I can't lose. I'm going to caddy for Hogan. Oh, <laughs> Mary Livingston, Rochester, Dennis Day, Bob Crosby, and yours truly, Bob Wilson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's take you back to yesterday. Last night, the members of the Beverly Hills Beavers put on a play at the school auditorium. Of course, Jack Benny, who happens to be the treasurer of the club, was planning to go. We now find Rochester pressing Jack's tuxedo. Press it once and press it twice and press it once again. It's been a long, long time. <laughs> Well, I got the pants pressed. Now I better finish pressing the coat. I wonder where Mr. Benny bought this tuxedo. It should be on the label. Yeah, there it is. The Pep Boys. <laughs> All right, 
Yes, sir. Have you finished pressing my clothes yet? Yes, boss, but who was the last one you rented this tub seater to? Why? Every time I lay the coat down, the arms fold. <laughs> Oh, stop. Anyway, you're only going to a school play. Why dress formal? Well, Rochester, the Beavers aren't putting on just a play. They're going to do their version of my radio program. You see, each one of the kids will portray a member of my cast. Oh. And since I'm the inspiration for their show, they may ask me to come up on the stage and make a speech. Gosh, I'll never forget ten years ago when I made that speech at the Academy Awards. Boss, I didn't know you were on the speaker's list. I wasn't, but I just had to get up and tell them what I thought of them. <laughs> Glad I did, too. I'll get her, Rochester. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Am I early? Well, we don't have to be at the school auditorium for a half hour yet. Sit down, Mary. Thanks. You know, just before I left home, I was talking on the phone to Mama. Oh, your mother, eh? Mm-hmm. What did the no loose ends of Plainfield have to say? <laughs> she told me she read in the paper about your visit with President Eisenhower. That's right, Mary. I did visit the president. Did he show you around the White House? Yes, Mary. He was very nice to me. And, Mary, remember when you saw the White House on television, that big room where the piano was? Uh-huh. There's a putting green there now. <laughs> Pretty nice, though. Huh? Here's your tuxedo, boss. Oh, help me out with the coat, Rochester. I want to see if it still fits. Thanks. Jack, if you wear that old tuxedo again, I'm not going out with you. It's so old-fashioned now. Old-fashioned? Yes, look how long the coat is. <laughs> what are you laughing at? You look like the villain in The Drunkard. <laughs> Only when I wear the cape. <laughs> Now, Mary... Jack, I mean it. I wouldn't be seen dead in that tuxedo. Our last customer didn't mind. <laughs> now, cut that out. I'm going to wear this tuxedo, and that settles it. Now, Rochester, I won't be home and... There's the phone. I'll get it. Hello? Hi, Jack. This is Bob. Oh. I hate to bother you today, but... Well, I wanted to let you know I'm on jury duty. Jury duty? You're mm -hmm. kidding. No, the first case comes up Wednesday, and it's... May last for weeks. But this is ridiculous. You'll miss my show. Didn't you tell him you worked for me? Yes, I did, Jack. Well, why didn't you tell him it would be a hardship if you had to lose the income from my show? Well, I told him, Jack, but that didn't work either. Why not? Well, they pay more than you do. <laughs> what? Three bucks a day. <laughs> well, that temporary work is always high. <laughs> But, Bob, I just can't let you miss my show. Well, there's really nothing you can do about it, Jack. Oh, no? What about my contract with you? Well, that's the case that we're trying Wednesday. <laughs> now, look, stop joking, Bob. I need you for the show, so I wish you'd try and make it. Okay. Say, Jack, don't you think it's about time we left for the school auditorium? Yes, we haven't got much time. Rochester, get my car out of the garage, will you please? You can't use the car, boss. A nail went through one of the tires. Oh. I told you not to buy such cheap tires. Well, Rochester, the most expensive tire in the world can be punctured by a nail. A fingernail? <laughs> well, what did you touch it for? <laughs> Always testing. <laughs> now what are we going to do? Well, I've got my car outside. Okay, we'll go in yours. Come on. Bye, Rochester. Goodbye. 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 <laughs> Jack, wasn't that a nice song Bob sang? Yeah The sun is shining Oh, happy day They may cut taxes I feel so gay Oh, look, Jack, here comes Dennis on a bicycle Where? Oh, hello, Mary Hello, Mr. Benny Oh, hello, kid Gee, we were just leaving for the school auditorium. Aren't you going to see the Beverly Hills Beavers put on their play? Oh, sure, but it's such a nice night, I thought I'd ride over on my new bicycle. Oh, is that a new one, Dennis? Yeah, I won it last night on a quiz program. On a quiz program? Gosh, you're really lucky. Yeah. Well, was it a hard question? Oh, no, it was easy. The man pointed at me and said, would you pay $100 for this bicycle? I said, yes, so I gave him the $100 and he gave me the bicycle. <laughs> Dennis. I almost won a refrigerator, but I didn't have enough money. 
<laughs> Look, kid, did the master ceremony of this quiz program have a little hammer in his hand? Uh-huh. Dennis, you were at an auction. Certainly. All those people crowd around were bidding. I know what I'd have done if I'd have had the hammer. Now, come on, we better get to the... <laughs> Now, come on, we better get to the school auditorium. Okay. Oh, by the way, Dennis, did you ask your mother if you could go duck hunting with me again next week? Yeah. Dennis, I didn't know you go with Mr. Benny on his hunting trip. Oh, sure, I'm his retriever. You... <laughs> you mean when he shoots, you bring back the duck? No, when he misses, I have to bring back the buckshot. <laughs> all right, all right. Now, Dennis, leave your bicycle here and come with us. Okay. <laughs> Say, this school auditorium really is packed. Well, we got pretty good seats, didn't we, Mary? Oh, these are fine. Right in the center, too. Can you see all right, Dennis? No. <laughs> Why'd you ask that man in front of you to take off his hat? It isn't his. What? It's mine. I put it there. <laughs> well, take it off and be quiet. Hey, Mr. Benny. Mr. Benny. Oh, hello, Joey. Is everything ready backstage for your show? Uh-huh. Are the kids nervous? Yeah, a little bit. Well, good luck. Thanks, Mr. Benny. And by the way, you'll be happy to know that we're almost sold out of popcorn. Well, good, good. Now, push the lemonade. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. You know, Miss Livingston, tonight we're going to do a takeoff on Mr. Benny's radio show. I know. Say, Joey, did you finally get a fat kid to play Don Wilson? Uh-huh. Good, good. Now, you better hurry or you'll be late, huh? Well, Mary, it won't be long now before the show starts. Gee, I hope the beavers really do it. Hey, hey, Mary. Mary. Huh? Don't look now, but there's a lady across the aisle who keeps staring at me. I guess she recognizes me. Where? Here she comes. Pardon me, but would you be good enough to give me your autograph? Why, certainly. There you are. Thank you. You were wonderful in the drunkard. <laughs> not to wear that cape. I'll take it off. You know, Mary, this idea of the little kid doing my radio program is really clever, isn't oh, it? Yes, yes. I think it's the cutest thing that... Oh, the curtain's going up. Yeah, yeah. And look, look, they've even got a kid orchestra. Quiet, here they go. <laughs> Starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Rochester, and Dennis Day, Bob Crosby, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to bring you the star of our show. A man who still has the first dollar he's ever earned. Not because he's cheap, because you can't spend Confederate money. <laughs> Jack Benny. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking. And Don, did you think up that introduction all by yourself? <laughs> yes, Jack, and I thought it was very funny. Oh, you did, eh? Yes. <laughs> Don. <laughs> Don. <laughs> the boo boy. <laughs> hey, take it easy. The last time you shook like that, you got a proposal from Hilo Hattie. <laughs> and another thing, Don. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. How you done? Say, Mary, I called you last night, but your mate said you were out. That's right. I went to the baseball game with Van Johnson. That was nice. Who won? When you was Van Johnson, who watches the game? <laughs> Mary, what's this you dropped on the floor? That? Oh, that's the letter I got from Mama. From your mother, eh? What does the third dimension of playing field have to say? <laughs> I'll read it to you. <laughs> My darling daughter, Mary, just a few lines to let you know that we are all well. The weather's nice here now, but as you probably read in the paper, we had an awful blizzard. And when your father came in from the barn, his milking hands were frozen. Gee. I hope it thaws out soon, as we'd like to get the cow out of the house. <laughs> I don't blame them. Hey, 
Mary. Mary, that little girl is a natural-born actress. Yeah, she went right on reading the letter, even though her bloomers were slipping down. <laughs> yeah. No other news, so we'll close now with love your loving mother, Mama. You know, Mary, your mother's letters get better all the time. But let's get on with the show. Oh, Bob. Bob Crosby, I'm talking to you. Oh, I'm sorry, Jack. I didn't hear you. Didn't hear me? No, I've been rehearsing a band and my ears are still folded. <laughs> oh, say, Bob, I meant to ask you, did you learn how to pronounce that word yet? I think so. Let me hear you say it. Manischewitz. <laughs> Bob, you don't want to disgrace your wife and children. Say, Jack, what is it, Don? I think this fellow has a telegram for you. Well, what's he waiting for? Oh, boy, boy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, fine. Are you from Western Union? Who do you think I am with this uniform, Nelson Eddy? <laughs> Never mind. Just give me the message. Here you are. And here's a tip for you. Oh, boy, a nickel. Now I can send my father through college. <laughs> Say, I've had trouble with you before. What's the matter with you? Do you enjoy aggravating me? No, <laughs> Now, let's see. I wonder who this Jack, is. Jack, you only gave a, a nickel tip. That's the cheapest thing I ever heard of. Mary, be quiet. Or you'll be known as Nylon Nelly at the May Company. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction tonight, we are going to do... Hello, it. Mr. Benny. Hello, Mary. Hello, Dennis. Hey, kid. I'm glad you got here because it's time for your... Wait a minute. Dennis, look at me. Huh? Dennis, this is the first time I ever saw you wearing glasses. Are your eyes bad? No. Then why are you wearing those glasses? My uncle died and left them to me. Yeah. <laughs> your uncle? Oh, that's a shame. Yeah, I can't see a darn thing with <laughs> Well, for heaven's sake, kid, if you can't see with them, take them off. Just because somebody leaves you something in a will, you're not compelled to use it. I'm not? No. Anybody want to buy a set of teeth? <laughs> now, cut that out. <laughs> and take off those glasses. It's time for your song. Okay. While you're singing, I'm going out in the hall and get a candy bar out of the machine. <laughs> Where's the candy machine? Oh, here it is. Now, let's see. They've got Hershey, Circus Peanuts, Lifesavers, Babe Ruth, and Milky Dip. I think I'll get that one. A Milky Dip. He bud. Bud. <laughs> huh? Come here a minute. <laughs> Who, me? Yeah, what you doing? I'm getting some candy. What kind? A Milky Dip. Uh-uh. <laughs> what? Get a Hershey bar. <laughs> Why a Hershey bar? In this hot weather, nothing runs like chocolate. <laughs> A milky dip. Milky dip hasn't got a chance. <laughs> what are you talking about? Milky dip not only has chocolate on the outside, but it has cream in the center. That's what'll give you the trouble. <laughs> what? Cream is hard to handle unless you whip it. <laughs> Get a Hershey bar? Can't miss. Look at last performance. <laughs> last performance? Yeah. Coming out of the machine, Hershey was boxed in by life saver, but got through the hole. <laughs> really? 
a lifesaver was to flavor it. <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm still gonna... Wait a minute. I know what I'll do. I'll get on and enjoy it. Okay, it's your don't. <laughs> Wasn't he cute, Jack? Just like the tout on our show. Yeah. Hurry up, Jack. Get us to finish the song. Okay, Mary. What took you so long, Jack? Oh, I ran into that racetrack house. Now, where were we? We're supposed to start our skit. Oh, yes. Well, hold it a second. Kid, before we start, I want to call Rochester. Oh, uh, Mabel. What is it, Gertrude? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Benny's line is flashing. I wonder what the smell of killing and Jarrah was now. <laughs> Well, I'll answer it and find out. Hello? Hello? Gertrude, will you try to get me rocked up to, please? Just a moment, Blue Eyes. <laughs> he wants I should get him rocked up It's a good thing he talked to you. I'd have hung up on him. <laughs> Why? Jack took me out once and didn't even kiss me goodnight. I can't understand it. I even brought my lips up close to him. Like this. Well, no wonder he didn't kiss you. What? I've seen a better pucker on a clothes laundry bed. <laughs> Operator. Operator. Get me locked, Chester. Yes, Mr. Benny. I'm ringing for you. Mr. Benny's residence, dark stage, screen, radio, television, and the man who knows. <laughs> Never mind that, Rochester. Oh, it's you, boss. Yeah. Did the man from the used car lot come around to buy my car? Yes, sir. Well, did you tell him the price was $1,000? Uh-huh, but he told me that the used car market has dropped them in the last few days. Oh, what did he offer you? Seven fifty. <laughs> well, that isn't so bad. You ought to see where the decimal point is. <laughs> Rochester, stop being on his side. You know as well as I do that the car's worth a thousand dollars. Oh, boss, come now. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, tell the man I'm not selling it anyway, and come down to the studio and pick me up. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Jack, you were on the phone so long we haven't got time to do the play. I don't know. You try to put on a program and something always happens. Play, Bob. Lemonade? Get your lemonade in the lobby. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Rochester, Dennis Day, Bob Crosby, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, last Monday, Jack Benny took the Super Chief to New York to attend the testimonial dinner given by the Friars Club in honor of Bob Hope. Let's look in on him as he packs for the trip with the help of Rochester. Well, I think I better take some more warm clothing. It gets pretty cold in New York this time of the year. Yes, sir. I've already put in your long underwear. Good. I also want my heavy woolen socks. Uh-huh. My heavy suit. Got it. A couple of thick sweaters. Uh-huh. My hat and my woolen scarf. Yes. My earmuffs, sheepskin lined coat, and fur lined gloves. That ought to wait a minute, Rochester. What's in that bag? You may get hungry, so I put in some whale blubber. <laughs> Never mind the jokes. It does get cold in New York. Now, let's see. I'm going to be on the train for three days. I better take something to read. Rochester, pack about five or six of my books. You know, the ones on the table there. Yes. Uh-oh. Which book did you drop? The one from the California bank. <laughs> Well, watch it next time. I wonder whether I should take my violin along or not. Should we put it to a vote? <laughs> Never mind. Eh, I'm not going to take it. Now, Rochester, if anybody wants to contact me while I'm in New York, I'll be at the Acme Plaza Hotel. Again? 
<coughs> yes, and you don't have to use that tone of voice. They treat me very nice at the Acme Plaza. In fact, this time they're giving me the penthouse suite. Oh, that's nice. That's the one that underlooks the park. <laughs> Never mind that. Since you were there with me last, that hotel has made a lot of improvements. You remember how every time I'd want to take a bath, I'd have to stand in line? Yes. Well, they put a bench there now. <laughs> and not only that, they... I'll get it, Rochester. Yes. Hello? Hello, Chuck. I have to talk fast, so don't interrupt. My father's found out that we're in love, so if we're going to get married, Chuck, we better elope. I'll get my things ready, and I'll be waiting for you. Goodbye, Chuck. <laughs> Hmm. Who was it, boss? Be a wrong number. <laughs> Must be a wrong number. I don't know any girls whose fathers are still alive. <laughs> yeah, I hope Chuck gets in touch with her. It'll probably spoil her honeymoon. Well, I've got everything ready, Mr. Benny, but you haven't got enough baggage. I know. I left mine in Palm Springs. But Bob Crosby's lending me a suitcase. He promised to bring it over. See, I like going to New York. East side, west side, all around the town. You know, yeah. I, I sure wish I was going to New York with you. You need me, boss. Now, look, Rochester, I don't need you. I know that all you want to do is to get to Harlem, and I won't see you again until it's time to come home. You spent all your time there with your girlfriend, Dorothy. But, boss... No buts about it. The last time we went to New York, you didn't even wait till the train got into Grand Central. You pulled the emergency cord at 125th Street. <laughs> I know. Well, what was the big emergency? I had to get over to Dorothy's fast. Her boyfriend was the engineer on the train. <laughs> oh, I see. East side, west side, all around the town. I'll be at the Acme Plaza penthouse two flights down. <laughs> la, 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 la. I'll answer the door, Rochester. You get my toothbrush and shaving stuff ready. Oh, hello, Bob. Hi, Jack. I brought the suitcase. Oh, thanks a lot. Come on in. Let's bring it in the other room where I'm packing. Oh, hello, Mr. Crosby. Say, that's the most expensive bag I've ever seen. And look at those initials in gold. B.C. Gee, Bob, this bag must have cost a lot of money. Oh, I don't know. You say it's Bangs. He loaned it to me. <laughs> oh, well, it certainly is the most beautiful suitcase I've ever seen. Let me open it. She and it's just as beautiful on the inside. It's all fitted and made into sections. Bing had it made that way. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. What are all these compartments for? Well, they're all marked. See, uh, handkerchiefs, socks, ties, 20s, 50s, and 100s. <laughs> oh, oh, yes, yes. Now I see. Some of the green rubbed off there. <laughs> Well, this is the most novel suitcase I've ever seen. Well, Bing thinks of everything. Jack, uh, turn that little knob there on the side. The side of the suitcase? Mm -hmm. This knob here? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, turn it. Well, I'll be darned. Minute made orange juice. <laughs> well, Bob, it's awfully nice of you to lend me this bag. And Hey, wait a minute. What's this? Looks like a little sunbonnet. Oh, Lord. We packed the baby's things in this when we went to Palm Springs. I guess we forgot to take some of the things out. Oh, uh, isn't this cute? The tiniest little dress I've ever seen. Look at these baby shoes, too. Bob, I mean, what does a baby need with all these handkerchiefs? Jack, they're not handkerchiefs. Oh, oh, oh! <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, Jack, I've got to be running along because... Excuse me a minute, Bob. I want to answer the phone. Hello? I'm all ready, Chuck. I've got my bag packed and I'm in my room on the third floor. But I'm a little nervous, so you'll have to carry me down the ladder. Goodbye, Chuck. <laughs> well, that's ridiculous. See, I haven't thought of eloping since I saw Theta Berra in Passion's Plaything. <laughs> Why can't that girl get the right number? Is there anything wrong, Jack? Yes, Bob, but it's a long story. Well, I got... I think I'd better get back home. You know, I'm rehearsing a new song, and 
Charlie Bagby's coming over to accompany me on the piano. Have a nice trip. Oh, thanks a lot, Bob. Give my regards to Charlie and... Hey, wait a minute. Say, could it be... No, I guess not. <laughs> but then again, nah, it's silly to even think that. What's the matter, Jack? Well, tell me, is Charlie Bagby ever called Chuck? Huh? No, why? Well, some girl keeps calling me, and she's going to elope with some guy named Chuck. Oh, that wouldn't be Bagby. He hates women now. What do you mean now? Well, Jack, didn't you know that Charlie was all set to be married? And on the very day of the wedding, his girl jilted him? You mean she stood him up? Yeah, but he fell right back down again. <laughs> well, I don't blame her then. Well, I guess I'll run along now. Well, goodbye. See you when I get back. And, oh, by the way, enjoy yourself. Oh, and, thanks. And say, you? you know, enjoy yourself. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Enjoy yourself. By the way, you know the weather in New York can get pretty cold. Are you taking your long underwear? Jack, I said, are you taking your long underwear? Mr. Crosby, you're new here. We've done all those flap jokes. <laughs> yes, Bob. <laughs> well, so long. So long, Jack. <laughs> now, Rochester, uh, put all the extra clothes in the suitcase and hurry, will you? I want to be ready when Miss Livingston picks me up. Oh, Pauline. Pauline. Yes, Miss Livingston. Uh, if there are any calls for me while I'm gone, tell them I'll be back as soon as Mr. Benny's train leaves. Yes, ma'am. Miss Livingston, what's he going to New York for this time? Well, the Friars are giving Bob Hope a testimonial dinner, and Mr. Benny is supposed to make a speech there. Is he a good after-dinner speaker? Oh, yes. You should have heard him last night. He made one of the most stirring after-dinner speeches I ever heard. Where was that? At the thrifty drugstore. <laughs> The thrifty drugstore. Yes, right after we had dinner, he jumped up on the counter and complained about the bill. <laughs> Gee, Miss Livingston, what did you do? What I always do. I paid it and we went home. <laughs> anyway, I hope Jack is a big hit in New York. You know, Miss Livingston, I don't think it's fair. Uh, what isn't fair, Pauline? Well, Mr. Benny goes to testimonial dinners and gets all the glory, but you're the real star of his radio program. Oh, Pauline, you're sweet, but Mr. Benny has more to say on the show than I do. Straight lines, yes, but you get all the laughs. <laughs> oh, Pauline. Yes, you do. And where would he be if, if, if you didn't read all those hilarious letters from your mother? Well? And what would happen if he couldn't make jokes about you working at the May Company? Yeah. And every week he gets a great big salary and all you get is a few dollars. Hmm. I never thought of that. Hello? Mary, what's keeping you? I ought to slap your face. <laughs> Miss Livingston, who was it? The stooge. <laughs> I promised to take him to the station, so I might as well do it. Well, here we are at the station. It sure is nice of you to let me drive your car, Miss Livingston. Oh, that's all right, Rochester. And now, boss, I'll park the car and take care of the baggage while you get your ticket validated. That'll make everything according to your schedule. Schedule? Yes. You see, Mary, I have so little time on this trip that I got everything planned. I catch the super chief here at 8 p.m. tonight. I'm in Chicago at noon the day after tomorrow. I get on the 20th century at 5 o'clock, arrive in New York at 9 a.m., go to my room at the Acme Plaza, take a nap until 4 in the afternoon, get up, wash, shave, and shower by 5, dress by 6, get to the Waldorf by 8, and attend Bob Hope's dinner. Then catch the plane at 11.30 and be home the next morning. Boy, what you won't go through to get a free meal. <laughs> Free meal, free meal. Come on, let's get into the station. Jack, I thought you told Rochester to take your bag. How come you're carrying that suitcase? Oh, I want to take extra good care of it, Mary. It's a very expensive bag, and it belongs to Bing Crosby. Oh. Say, Jack, let's go over to the soda fountain. I'm kind of thirsty. Just get a lily cup. I'll give you some orange juice. (laughs) 
What? On second thought, we haven't time for that. Let's see, where do I get my ticket validated? Attention, please. Attention. The Sunset Limited, now leaving for Baton Rouge, New Orleans, and Jambalaya. Son of a gun, we have big fun on the bio. <laughs> Mary, you wait here for me, will you? Okay, I'll go over to the newsstand and buy a magazine. Okay. Now, let's see if I... Uh... Oh, hello, Jack. Oh, hello, Don. Oh, boy, I'm sure glad I caught you. You almost didn't, Don. It's just a few minutes to train time. I know, but it wasn't my fault. My wife and I took her nephew, Tommy, out to dinner. Tommy? Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, I know him. He's that mischievous little kid, isn't he? Ah, he's not so bad, Jack. He isn't, eh, Don? That kid can get into more trouble. Well, as a matter of fact, he did embarrass me a little. I can imagine. That boy is the worst. What happened? Well, after dinner, I paid the check and left a couple of bucks for the waitress, and then we drove home. And when we got there, Tommy stuck out his hand and said, Uncle, here's the two dollars you left on the table. (laughs) Gee, what a wonderful kid. (laughs) I had them all wrong, you know. The Union Pacific Streamliner now arriving from Las Vegas on track... Seventeen. Now I've got to get my ticket validated. Attention, please. Attention. We have a special announcement to make about our lost and found department. It's been lost. (laughs) Now, let's see... Oh, there's the window where I'm supposed to go. The super chief departs on track nine in ten minutes. Well, I better go get my ticket validated. Now, let's see. Oh, there's the window. Attention, please. Attention. The new 160-mile-an-hour super streak now leaving for Phoenix, El Paso, St. Louis, New York, and maybe London. (laughs) What does he mean, maybe London? It has bad brakes. <laughs> well, that's the silliest thing I ever heard. Uh, Jack, Jack, you got your ticket validated? No. Well, you better hurry. The super chief will be leaving soon. I know. Here, I bought you some magazines. The Saturday Evening Post, Reader's Digest, Collier's, and Jack, you'll love this book. What is it? How to Make Money Straightening Gopher's Teeth. <laughs> Mary, you're very funny. <laughs> My maid thinks so. <laughs> Well, never mind. Attention, please. Attention. This is contrary to our policy, but there is someone here who wishes to make a special announcement. Go ahead. Chuck, I got out of the house myself, and I'm waiting for you. I would have been here sooner, but I stopped at the bank and drew out all of my money. Ten thousand dollars. Ten thousand... Coming! (laughs) Coming! Yeah! Huh? Oh. Oh, excuse me, Mary. (laughs) What's the matter with me? I don't even know her. Now, Mary, wait here. I'm going to take care of my ticket. It's that window over there. Oh, mister, are you the man who validates tickets? No, I'm just here because I was born with this rubber stamp in my hand. <laughs> Look, all I want you to do is validate my ticket. You're very well. Where are you going? To New York. Good. Now, if we can just get rid of the smog. <laughs> Never mind that. I have... I have my ticket, but not my Pullman space. Well, would you like a compartment? No, no, I'm by myself. A roommate? No, I don't even need that. As a matter of fact, I don't even need a lower berth. Tell me, do you have any uppers? Well, I... Wait a minute. Ask me that again. Do you have any uppers? Yes, and if you don't go away, I'll bite you. You're very funny. You're my butler, think so. Now cut that off! <laughs> the super chief now leaving for Kansas City and Chicago. Jack, Jack, you'll miss the train. Hurry! I will if this man will stamp my ticket. Okay, there. Now go already. The out, Mary. I got to run for it. Goodbye. Bye, Jack. Phew. I just made it. Oh, so did I. Oh, Chuck, give me a boost. What? Oh, she's not talking to me. Come on, 
Chuck, give me a boot. Okay, honey, give me your hand. Well, I'll be darned. It really is Bagby. <laughs> Now, let's see. After applying braces to the gopher's teeth, you apply pressure by tightening every three months. <laughs> oh, this is ridiculous. I'll just sit here and... Hmm. I wonder why all the passengers are going up toward the front of the train. I think I'll follow them and see. See, everybody's crowded around the engineer. I wonder what he's doing. By the power vested in me by the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, I now pronounce you man and wife. Oh, Chuck, now you're mine. Oh, mine. Uh, isn't that sweet? Good night, folks. Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Rochester, Dennis A. Bob Crosby, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, yesterday Jack Benny returned from a trip to New York where he attended a dinner given for Bob Hope by the Friars Club. Right now it's morning and Jack is just getting up. Ah, uh, good morning, Rochester. Good morning, boss. How'd you sleep? Oh, pretty good. Only I was awfully cold last night. You're cold every night. Maybe you haven't got enough blood. Rochester, I'm not anemic. Now, lay out my clothes and get me a clean shirt. I don't want to be late for rehearsal. Yes, sir. <laughs> Not anemic. I wonder what he'd say if he found out that every morning I sneak in the bathroom and put ketchup on his razor to keep up his morale. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's see. The shirt should be in this drawer. Socks. Handkerchiefs. Sweater. Uh-oh, what's this? A bottle of ketchup. Hmm. Rochester, how about my shirt? Coming, boss. Here it is. Oh, thanks. Say, boss, while I was getting the shirt out of the drawer, I noticed a bottle of ketchup. Oh, you did, eh? Yeah. Where'd you get it? Rochester, come here a minute. Huh? I got a little surprise for you. Surprise? Yeah, if you keep putting it on, I'm going to keep scraping it off. I'm not wasting it just to please my vanity. <laughs> now, Rochester, look, I want to... I get it. Hello, Jack. Oh, hello, Mary. Come on in. When did you get back from New York? Oh, about 4 o'clock this morning. It was a nice trip, though. Uh, how'd the Bob Hope dinner turn out? Oh, it was swell. Everybody was there. Gee, what celebrity. And you know what? I sat on the dais right next to Bernard Baruch. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. You haven't seen him since you went to school together. <laughs> you know, Mary, you always say the cutest thing just before you get a cut in salary. <laughs> Oh, I was only teasing. Now, you better hurry. We'll be late for rehearsal. Why? We've got a lot. Of... Oh, my goodness, look what time it is. I never realized it was this late. You still have to shave. I know, I know. It won't take long. I'll take off my tie. I'll get the razor. I'll get the ketchup. <laughs> we haven't time for that now. You go get the car, Rochester. We'll be down in a minute. Try the motor again, Rochester. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, try it again, Rochester. Only this time, step on the throttle, advance the spark, pull out the choke, and hold down the clutch. Keep talking, boss. So far, you haven't named one thing we've done. <laughs> All right, all right. Try the motor again. Jack, last month when the automobile show was in town, you said you were going down and look at a new car. I did, but the one I wanted to buy, they're not making yet. You see, it's that revolutionary car with three wheels. Three wheels? Is that good? It's one more than we've got now. <laughs> oh, stop. <laughs> Try the motor again. Right? Yes, sir. <laughs> There we are. I knew we wouldn't have any trouble. (laughs) 
Rochester, here we are at the studio. Yes, sir. See, I wish there was some place to park along the street here. Oh, for heaven's sake, Jack. Why don't you put it in a parking lot? Yeah, I guess we'll have to. All right, Rochester, drive in here. Oh, boy, a real parking lot. Clay, I tell the boys down the lot about this. <laughs> Never mind, just go in. Now, Rochester, you go over and pay the attendant. Miss Livingston and I are going into the studio. Yes, sir. Come on, Mary. Say, hey, Jack, look at that beautiful car driving in. Gee, what a car. A chauffeur in uniform and everything. Must be the president of the network. Here we are, sir. Thank you, James. It's Dennis. Let's watch this. I'll get your things out of the car, sir. Your coat, sir. Thank you. Your hat, sir. Thank you. Your Wall Street Journal. Thank you. Your Buck Rogers disintegrator. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, hey, Dennis. Dennis. Huh? Oh, hello, Mr. Benny. Hello, Mary. Gee, Dennis, I've never seen such a beautiful car. Where'd you get it? Oh, my mother gave it to me for a going away present. Dennis, where are you going? Well, she doesn't care as long as I go. <laughs> We'd better get into the studio. We'd be late. Yeah, come on. Let's go. All right, fellas. Okay, fellas, let's run through that number once more. Uh, hold it, Bob. Hold it. I'm here. Oh, hi, Jack. Uh, I was just rehearsing the band. Well, that like, Say, wait a minute. Aren't some of the boys missing? Yeah, Remley, Bagby, and Sammy the drummer won't be here for the show. Why not? Well, last night they were listening to a quiz program, and the MC was asking questions about arithmetic. What's that got to do with it? Well, one of the questions was about fractions. It was, how many times will one-fifth go into three? <laughs> So they started working it out. Uh-huh. And by the time they killed off 22 fifths, they lost interest in the answer. I can't understand. I thought when Phil Harris left, the boys would change. Oh, they will, Jack. They will. But when? Well, as soon as they find out that Phil is gone. <laughs> well, Bob, who do they think you are? Well, I don't know, but they keep calling me Alice. Well, don't worry, Bob. For five years, they thought I was Evelyn and her magic violin. <laughs> Gosh, the free dinners that I've had. <laughs> well, go on with the rehearsal, Bob, so we can get into the sketch here. Well, shall I rehearse my song first, Mr. Benny? Yes, go ahead, Dennis. Then we'll go right on with the play. That was very good, Dennis. Very good. And now, kids, let's rehearse the play we're going to do. Oh, Don. Oh, yes, Jack. Uh, set the scene, will you? Okay. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we present our version of The Snows of Kilimanjaro. Produced by 20th Century Fox, makers of that new picture, Niagara. Starring yours truly, Don Wilson. Don, stick to the script. You weren't the star of Niagara. I know, but I need the publicity. My calendars aren't selling at all. <laughs> Just read what's written, will you please? Okay. We spent a whole week writing. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we present our version of The Snows of Kilimanjaro, which starred Gregory Peck, Susan Hayward, and Ava Gardner. Our story opens in the African jungle, at the foot of the majestic snow-capped mountain, Kilimanjaro. <laughs> Oh, I've seen vultures before. 
before. But these two are carrying a bottle of ketchup. <laughs> I was recommended to them by Duncan Hyde. <laughs> As my temperature rose, I felt a soft, cool hand on my forehead. It was my wife, Susan, tenderly stroking my fevered brow. And as I muttered and moaned in my delirium, she said, Cut out that blubbering, Mac! <laughs> I can't help it, Susan. Look at me. Lying here helpless. While all the members of my safari are starving because I can't go out and hunt fresh meat for them. Don't worry about that. This morning I went out in the jungle and killed a lion. But wait a minute, Susan. We're out of ammunition. How did you kill the lion? I strangled it. <laughs> wow. How the world... How in the world could you possibly bring yourself to strangle a lion? I used one hand. I gave it a fighting chance. <laughs> when is that medicine coming? When will the plane get here? When, when, when? The plane didn't arrive with the medicine, and I got worse. So in desperation, Susan sent for a native witch doctor. The witch doctor came, and for the next two hours, he kept stuffing hot sand into my mouth. When my hat got too big for me, I realized he was shrinking my head. <laughs> Fortunately, I stopped him in time. But to this day, I wear a size two and three eighths. <laughs> I shall never forget that witch doctor. He sprinkled me with a powder made from ground tiger teeth. Then he chanted his weird voodoo incantation. Oh, doctor, I'm in such pain. Here, you take on these herbs, you. Come morning, son, you feel all the better like me. Oh, that's wonderful, doctor. How much do I owe you? Nothing. Blue Cross. <laughs> the witch doctor left. And as the night wore on, my feverish mind was frightened by the sounds of the jungle. The roar of the lion. Yeah. <laughs> the cry of the wild boar. The frightened whinny of our horses. The wild chattering of the monkeys. The maniacal screech of the hyena. sound of the crocodile. <laughs> the terrifying sound of the crocodile. I knew if I kept trying, I'd find something that Mel Blank couldn't do. <laughs> the quietness of the long night was broken by the jungle sounds, the sighing of the soft winds, and the constant beat of the talking drums by which the natives communicated with each other. When they finished, I felt a little better. Their song had put me in a romantic mood. I began to think of all the girls I had known. Constance Forsythe, Rosalind Winston, Valerie Fitzgerald, John Wilson. <laughs> I really thought of Marilyn Monroe, but Don's calendars aren't selling. <laughs> then I began to think of the first girl I had ever really loved. It was in Spain. I met her in Madrid. Like all Latin, she was impulsive and romantic, and beautiful. And best of all, she was in love with me. 
I shall never forget my first meeting with Maria. I said to her, It's a lovely place you have here, senorita. Gracias, senor. And it's very big, too. Si, sí, senor. See, it's so big. Do you know how much it costs? No, I just work here. Senor May owns the company. <laughs> there, too? <laughs> that was how my romance with Maria started. And it blossomed rapidly. We went everywhere together, dancing, swimming. And finally, she took me to the bullfight. <laughs> been dreaming. Has the plane arrived yet with the medicine? No, they were halfway across the Atlantic and they had to turn back for the peroxide. For my leg? No, for me. I wasn't born a blonde. <laughs> Susan's voice soothed me. <laughs> and again I fell asleep. I forgot the pain of the present as I remembered the pleasures of the past. And it was at this point I remembered I first met Ava in Paris. Gay Paris. Ava had everything. Beauty, poise, and intelligence. But even though she was a society heiress, she insisted on earning her living by singing in a tiny French nightclub called the Bayou. I shall never forget the first time I heard her as she sang. to do the town. I'm going to start by drinking champagne out of your slipper. Come on, put it on the table. Okay, there. Go ahead, start pouring. Take your foot out of it first. <laughs> That's better. Now I'll fill the slipper with champagne for me. There. 
Now fill your other slipper for you. Tell me, Ava, am I the first man who ever drank champagne from your slipper? Oh, they all do. You're kidding. No, I'm not. When I walk home from here, I sound like Chloe coming through the swamp. <laughs> hmm. I asked Ava to marry me, but she turned me down, so I married Susan. Gentlemen, as you probably know, our little star has completely recovered from his recent attack of influenza. But his doctors advised him to get a little sunshine and rest. So last Thursday, he got in his Maxwell and had Rochester drive him to Palm Springs. Gosh, Rochester, no matter how many times I make the trip, I still love the ride to Palm Springs. It is beautiful, boss. What town are we passing through now? Cabazon. Are you sure? Are you sure it's Cabazon? Certainly. We've been going through it for the past two hours. <laughs> I'd like to get to the springs before dark, although we're not making such bad time considering we had three blowouts. Five. No, no, Rochester. We only had three blowouts. Five. The tire blew out three times and your hair blew out twice. <laughs> Oh, yes. The man behind us thought we lost our foxtail. I mean, <laughs> anyway, we've been passing through some nice scenery. I know so many wineries and miles and miles of vineyards. Yeah, this is the wine country. And you notice the cows, how sleek and fat they are? They look so contented. They're more than contented. They're drunk. <laughs> Stop making things up, drunken cows. Of all the... Uh-oh. What's the matter? We're almost out of gas. We better stop at a gas station. Oh, all right. Now we have to go through lifting up the seat and everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. I I'll drive into the station on the corner. Uh, yes, sir. Fill her up. Well, how far are we from Palm Springs now? 17 miles. 17 miles, huh? Let me see. The altitude here is 3,100 feet. And the altitude of Palm Springs is 270 feet, which is a drop of 2,830 feet, which for 17 miles would be about three and a quarter percent grade. Now, the wind is at our back. <laughs> but at the pass, it becomes a headwind of about 19 miles an hour. Hmm. Let me see. Put in two and four-tenths gallons. <laughs> 
Yes, Mr. Einstein. <laughs> my name is an Einstein. Oh, yeah, your initials are on the side of the car, B.H. Those aren't my initials. They belong to the man I bought the car from. B.H. Bob Hope? No, Ben Hurt! <laughs> Never mind, Rogers. Just stand up and drive. Now, let's get going. We want to arrive at the springs before dark. <laughs> That was Thursday. Friday was a beautiful day, and Jack really enjoyed it. He visited Mary Livingston at the Park Lane Hotel, and they spent the afternoon around the swimming pool. Gee, the sun feels good, Mary. Yeah. A couple of more hours of this, and we'll both have beautiful tans. Say, uh, Mary. Uh, yes, Jack? Mary, I, I'd like to talk to you. Uh, what is it? Well, it's, uh, it's a little embarrassing. For heaven's sake, Jack, what is it? Well, I don't like to mention this, but uh, your bathing suit is awfully snug and skimpy. Well, go in and take it off. I didn't want to lend it to you in the first place. (laughs) Well, I can't help it if Rochester forgot to pack my suit. You think I like wearing yours? I'm going to have an awful time explaining my tan to the boys in the steam room. Stop pouting and enjoy yourself. I am enjoying myself. It's a fine town for you to catch a cold in, too. There's one spot I love for vacation, though. It's Palm Springs. Come on, Mary. Let's go in the pool. Last one in is a rotten egg. Gee, I didn't know Jack could die that well. Hmm. He hasn't come up yet. I wonder what happened. Hope there's nothing wrong. It's been nearly a minute. How can he hold his breath that long? I better jump in and... Oh, good, he's coming up now. Phew. Mary, why didn't you tell me those trunks had no strings? (laughs) The last time I ever wear your suit. Good. And take off my cap. You look like a honeydew melon. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm getting out. Oh, it's cold when you get out. Mary, throw me a towel. Okay, here you are. You didn't have to throw it so hard. Help me out of the pool. That was how Jack spent Friday. And on Saturday, feeling full of vim, vigor, and vitality, he tried his luck on the Tamarisk Golf Course with Bob Crosby. What'd you have on this hole, Bob? I had a par four. Four? Yes, Jack, four. Hmm. I was sure you took five strokes. Oh, no, my tee shot was right down the middle. Then I used the six iron, was right on the green. My first putt just rimmed the cup, and my second putt was in. Yeah, you're right. You did have a four. Well, I guess you win that hole. Why, what'd you have? Twelve. <laughs> well, maybe I'll beat you on this next hole. Go ahead, tee off. Okay. Nice shot, Bob. Now stand back, please. <clears throat> I want to make sure it's teed up just right. Well, here I go. Hmm. Missed it. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> They're not making the balls as big this year. Oh, quiet. <laughs> Stop grinning. You make me nervous. Now, here goes. There, I hit it. Hey, where'd the ball go, Bob? Oh, you sliced it out into the rough. Oh, well, let's go look for it. Da dee dee dee, boom, bo bee bee. Da dee dee dee, da dee do. Yeah, it's a pretty song, Bob. Yeah, I was going to do it on the show. Oh, good, good. Let me hear it now. If I don't find my ball, sing an encore or something, will you? <laughs> It's a nice song, Bob. I like the way you... Hold it, Jack. Uh, we're walking past your ball. Oh, where is it? Oh, it's right behind that tree. 
Say, he's got a real bad lie there. Oh, yeah. It was about 200 yards to the green. Got to keep it low so I don't hit the branches of the tree there. And I got to get up high to go over those other trees. Right in front of the green is that big sand trap. Bob, what do you think I ought to use? Ben Hogan. <laughs> Too light a club for me. I'm an ad living fool. Eh? <laughs> Let me see. Gee, I was in the same spot yesterday when I played with Stanley Curtis and George Howard. They're both watching the game. I thought I'd mention them. <laughs> this tree wasn't directly in the way. I could... Hey, where'd that ball go? You know where it went. You kicked it right out into the fairway. Well, it was an accident. Some accident. The first kick, you missed it. <laughs> well, it was an accident. I'm going to shoot it from there. Oh, no, you're not. The rules say that if you move a ball, it costs you a stroke, and you can't argue with me because I know the rules of golf. You know, Bob, this is an amazing coincidence. What's a coincidence? It was exactly this time last year, right here on this course, that my ex-orchestra leader became my ex-orchestra leader because he, too, knew the rules of golf. <laughs> Now, Patty, hand me my three wood. Thank you. Where to go? Where to go? Where to go? Well, I don't know, but when we get to the green, just drop a ball in the hole. I've got a wife and five kids to support. <laughs> oh, so there it is. J just on the green. There. Say, that was a slow shot, Jack. Yeah. Well, here's your ball, Bob. Your shot. Well, all I need is just a little chip. Mm, nice shot, Bob. Right on the green. Come on. Well, we're both on the green and two. Yeah. You putt first, Jack. You're away. Putt? Aren't you going to concede that? <laughs> Jack, you got a neat foot putt there. Give me one good reason why I should concede it. I'll give you a six. Your wife and five children. <laughs> Yes, folks, that's what Jack did Saturday. But now, this is Sunday, the day he does his radio broadcast. And in honor of our locale, today we're going to do a dramatic play based on the historical discovery of Palm Springs. Curtain. Music. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, although for centuries without number... The area around Palm Springs was known and loved by the Indians. It was not discovered by the white man till 1774. It was in this year that the Spaniards pushed through to the desert in California. But the Spaniards, hungry for gold, saw no value in this area and pushed on toward the coast. For nearly another century, Palm Springs remained sleeping in the sun. A veritable paradise for the Indians of the Agua Caliente tribe. This isn't funny, folks, but up till now, Don has had nothing. <laughs> Continue, Don. Then in the year 1853, two intrepid explorers headed west from Texas into the blistering, burning desert. The sun is sure hot today, Tex. Yep. His sand is burning my feet, Tex. I think it's even hotter than it was yesterday, Tex. I reckon you're right, Tex. One of us should have come from Colorado. <laughs> Tell you what, Tex, you can call me Slim. Okay, Slim. And I think we're lost in this desert because... Hey, wait a minute. Look, there's a man coming towards us. Oh, yes. Hello there. Buenos dias, mister. Now, look, amigo, we're lost. We've been wandering through this desert heat for days without water or food. Our skins are burned to a crisp and our feet worn raw. Maybe you can help us. What does that mean? Next time, take the train and relax. <laughs> Don't be stupid. There's not a train within a thousand miles of here. Yeah, do you live around here? Oh, no, mister. Then what are you doing out here in the desert anyway? I'm looking for my sister, mister. <laughs> Your sister's lost, eh? When'd she disappear? Last night was when I first missed her. Your sister? Yes, mister. <laughs> Did 
Have you been walking through the desert all day? Yes, and on my foot I have a blister. <laughs> well, that's too... Blister. <laughs> hmm. Hey, that fifth of yours, is she beautiful? Yes, you couldn't resist her. <laughs> well, maybe you can... Mister. I've had enough of this silly talk. Come on, Tex, let's go. Hey, wait a minute, Slim. Here comes somebody else. What are you hombres doing around my neck of the woods? Out of my way, mister. We're cracking onward. Oh, no, you ain't. Oh, yes, we are. Be careful, Slim. Be careful. That's Wendy Wilson, the toughest man in these here parts. Wendy Wilson, eh? Well, I'll take care of that. <laughs> Caught him right in the stomach. <laughs> Yes, sir. Oh, you got me. You got me. And now I'm a dying. I'm a heading for the big corral up yonder. Where the deer and the antelope play on fleecy clouds. Where there ain't no lost little doggies. And the chuck wagon is always filled. Yeah. I'm a heading for that big heavenly roundup in the sky. Yes. I'm a... Oh, oh shut up. You had enough to do. <laughs> I'm sorry. Come on, Tex. We got to go and discover Palm Springs. So long, amigo. Adios, and if I do not see you till then, happy Easter. Thanks. Easter. Yeah, yeah. Come on, Tex. Oh, one moment, senor. Now what? I bet you are surprised to meet a Mexican who does not do that silly talk about sigh. Sigh? Si. Now cut that! Tex, time to discover Palm Springs. No doubt about it, Tex. We're lost. Yeah, Slim. And you better go on without me. I can't make it. I'm too tired. I'm too thirsty. My throat is parched and... 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 Tex, what are you staring at? I look up ahead. There's a pool of clear, cold water and a beautiful girl standing beside it. Let's go. You can have the water. Tex! Tex, come back. It's only a mirage. Hello, beautiful. Hi, handsome. Tex, come back. It's a mirage. How about a kiss, sweetie? Okay, cutie. Come here. Tex, stop kissing that mirage. <laughs> Tex, we and see. I'll tell you, it's a mirage. Tex, stop. Oh, oh. What? You were making a fool out of yourself. You were standing there, kissing a mirage. Are you sure? <laughs> you had your arms around a cactus plant. Cactus plant? What a fool I've been. Yeah. For the past two weeks, I've been walking right by them. <laughs> Now, look, Tex, get a grip on yourself. Here, take these last few drops of water out of my canteen. I don't think we have too far to go. <laughs> Tex, look. Look, here, we made it. This is Palm Springs. Read the sign on that building. Welcome to Palm Springs. Try your luck at Cactus Peace Gambling Joint and Date Shop. <laughs> Come on. Let's go in. Hiya, fellas. Come on right in. Who are you? I'm Tumbleweed Tess, the owner. Oh, hello, Tess. Wait a minute. Hey, Tess, didn't I see you in a mirage before? No, that was my sister, Babe. She's a cactus plant. <laughs> see, Tess, I told you. Would you boys like to try your luck gambling? Well, sure. What do you got here? Blackjack, poker, dice, and roulette. I'd like to play a little roulette. Is it on the level? Are you kidding that wheel is so crooked, we have to have the brakes reliant twice a week. <laughs> well, I'm going to play some roulette. Come on, let's go in. All right, gentlemen, how about a little action around here? Pick your number and watch a wheel go around. I'll put $5 on 28. That's always been my lucky number. Okay, $5 on 28. <laughs> You lose. <laughs> now, wait a 
wait a minute. This game is crooked. And another thing, your face is familiar to me. Haven't I seen you before? Could be. In the last half hour, I was a gas station attendant, a Mexican, and a drunken cow. <laughs> I thought so. Come on, Tex, let's get out of here. Jack Benny is a regular feature of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. Uh, everybody, a little late. Starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Rochester, Dennis Day, Bob Crosby, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Let's go out to Jack Benny's house in Beverly Hills. It's morning, and he's just finished his breakfast. Did you enjoy your breakfast, Mr. Benny? Oh, yes, it was wonderful. You know, Rochester, I like starting off with that pink grapefruit. Where do those pink grapefruits come from? Florida. Florida, eh? I wonder what makes them pink. When they see the size of our California grapefruit, they blush. <laughs> oh, Rochester, you're cute. <laughs> and that was a swell breakfast. Say, say, Mr. Benny, you've got a little bit of egg on your chin. I have? Hand me a spoon. Oh, boss, wipe it off. It's not enough to say. <laughs> I'm not going to save it. I just didn't want to dirty a napkin. You know, our Bendix machines are loaded here. Roger, it's such a beautiful day. I think I'll, I'll go for a walk. You've been taking a lot of walks lately, Mr. Benny. I know. You see, when I left the hospital and went to Palm Springs, the doctor told me I was fine, but I ought to get a little more exercise. How would you like to mow the lawn? <laughs> no, no, I'll walk. Don't be so good to me, you know. I'll see you later. Gee, it's certainly nice out today. Everything looks so beautiful. Hmm, the air smells so fresh. I feel great since I got out of the hospital. A person doesn't realize the tremendous advances medical science has made. All those new wonder drugs they've invented. Oromycin, oromycetin, cortisone, penicillin and the four-way cold tablet. <laughs> now they've even got a 12-way cold tablet. That's for people who get sick watching three-dimensional pictures. <laughs> that stay in the hospital sure did me a lot of good. No business, no phone call. Just wonderful rest and quiet. Doctors wanted me to stay in the hospital a little longer, but I insisted on getting out. Twenty bucks a day. <laughs> Fortunately, I was getting twenty-five from the Blue Cross. <laughs> I think next week I'll tell them I'm out. <laughs> oh, boy, this walk is sure making me feel good. I wonder if... Oh, hello, Dennis. Sure, and we got our top of the morning. It's a pleasure equal to kissing the blarney stone itself, running into the likes of you and maybe wishing you a happy St. Patrick's Day there. <laughs> Wait a minute, Dennis. Aren't you celebrating St. Patrick's Day a little late? Oh, I forgot about it. Dennis, how could you possibly forget? Everybody was wearing green shirts and green ties and green socks, and the women were wearing green dresses and green hats. I thought it was a publicity stunt for chlorophyll. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake. Oh, by the way, Dennis, I'm a little disappointed in you. you. You didn't come to visit me when I was in the hospital. Well, I couldn't, Mr. Benny. I was sick at the time myself. You were? I didn't know that. Yeah, I had to have a doctor and everything. I felt awful. I had chills and fever and temperature and butterflies in my stomach. No kidding. What did the doctor do? He told me to stop eating the butterflies. <laughs> Dennis, come here a minute. If you hit me, I'll tell the Blue Cross you're out of the hospital. <laughs> Well, 
Well, goodbye, Dennis. I'll see you later. Oh, wait a minute, Mr. Benny. Don't you want to listen to the song I'm going to do on the show next week? Listen to it here? Here on the street? It'll be embarrassing. Yeah, I guess you're right, Mr. Benny. The last time I sang on the street, people started throwing money out of the windows. <laughs> Sing, kid. I'll get a broom. <laughs> How'd you like my song, Mr. Benny? Uh, just a minute, Dennis. 65, 70. <laughs> 75, 80. No, that's a bottle cap. <laughs> that's the one that landed right on my nose. They're right. Pepsi Cola hits the spot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so long, Dennis. Goodbye. That was a nice song that Dennis sang. Probably be a big hit. Tell me how to get to the farmer's market. Yes, yes, you turn right. Hey, aren't you my friend from Calabasas? Yes, sir. Hi, Rube. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, the farmer's market's on the corner of 3rd and Fairfax. You come into town to buy something? No, I'm taking this truckload of stuff from a farm to sell. Oh. What do you got in the truck? Pig's knuckles. <laughs> Pig's knuckles? Yeah, the pigs were driving me crazy, always cracking them. <laughs> oh, you're kidding. No, I'm not. Quiet, Pokey. <laughs> well, uh, I better get going, room. I'm in a hurry. Why, what's the rush? I want to get home before 8 o'clock. This is going to be a big night in Calabasas. They're reopening the movie house. They put in a new modern feature. Oh, you mean three-dimensional pictures? No, talkies. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoy them. Oh, I will. Can't wait to hear that Valentino fella talk. He's a hot one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, goodbye. Uh, so long, Rube. I'm the sheik of Arabi. Gosh, there's a real friendly person. Great fan of mine, too. <laughs> He's waving goodbye to me. Oh, no, it's one of the pig's knuckles. <laughs> but a fan is a fan. <laughs> Gosh, I walked all the way down to the shopping district. Hmm. Drucker's Barber Shop. Haircuts, a dollar fifty. How do you like that? They raised the price. Last time I got one, they were forty cents. Ah, <laughs> uh, say, what smells so good? Oh, it's this bakery here. Oh, boy, look at those nice looking cakes in the window. I think I'll go in and buy something. Huh? Yes, sir, what can I do for you? <laughs> well, I don't know. Everything looks so good here. Yeah. What do you recommend? Well, we got pies, cakes, donuts, brownies, and Cimarron rolls. <laughs> what? Cimarron rolls. <laughs> don't, don't you mean cinnamon? That's what I said, Cimarron rolls. <laughs> Well, I don't want any of those. I want to know, have you got any lady fingers? I used to have, but I had to get rid of them. They kept cracking their knuckles. <laughs> but don't be so smart. I came in here to buy something. Now, let's see. Oh, I know, I'll have a half a dozen donuts, that chocolate cake, and... Let's see, I'll have this Napoleon. That's a Josephine. <laughs> Well, mister, I've been having those for years. It's a Napoleon. It's a Josephine. This is Danish pastry. <laughs> well, see, I'll, uh, 
I'll have it anyway. And uh, say, on second thought, I think I'll have some of those Cimarron rolls. <laughs> what? I said I'll... <laughs> I said I'll have some of those Cimarron rolls. Don't you mean cinnamon rolls? <laughs> yes, yeah, give me six of them. Now, how much is it all together? Oh, let's see. Donuts, uh, chocolate, pastry, and a uh, half a dozen Cimarron rolls. <laughs> that comes to a dollar even. A dollar? Well, here you are. Goodbye. Goodbye, and call again. You're quite a character. <laughs> all right, all right. Goodbye. <laughs> hey, Rochester will be happy I stopped at the bakery. He loves donuts. I'll put a candle on one of them. Tomorrow's his birthday. <laughs> Gee, look at all the new sets in this television store window. Hey, they're advertising my TV show that goes on today. It says, don't miss Jack Benny's version of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Oh, boy, I love those shows where I can play two parts. Hi, Jack. What are you doing here? Huh? Oh, Bob Crosby. I was just looking at these television sets. Where are you going, Bob? Oh, nowhere. Just coming from Remley's house. You see, Frankie's sick in bed with the flu. Gosh, everybody seems to have had it. Is Remley taking good care of himself? Oh, yes. Starts out in the morning with a hot toddy. Nine o'clock, he has grapefruit juice and bourbon. <laughs> Ten o'clock, he has orange juice and vodka. Mm -hmm. and at noon, he has lime and gin. He keeps repeating this until bedtime. Well, for heaven's sake, who's his doctor? Oh, he hasn't got a doctor. He's got a bartender. <laughs> Well, of all the... Why doesn't he get a doctor? What? And get well? <laughs> what a guy. Well, I gotta be running along, Bob. Don't forget my television show this afternoon. Well, don't worry, Jack. I'll be watching it. Watching it? You're on it. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Well, <laughs> see you later. So long. Oh, Bob. Yes? You know... I got something funny to tell you. You know that word that you always have so much trouble pronouncing... Uh, uh... Manischewitz? Yeah, yeah. Well, I just ran into a fellow in a bakery who couldn't pronounce cinnamon rolls. Well, how do you... <laughs> how do you like that? You mean he couldn't say Cimarron rolls? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So long, Bob. So long. <laughs> Imagine Bob almost forgetting my TV show. Gee, I can't wait till I get on and do Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. The part I like is when I change from the nice, kind-hearted Dr. Jekyll into the mean, cruel Mr. Hyde. Boy, that really takes acting. <laughs> oh, my goodness. People are looking at me. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Gee, look what time it is. I better get down to the TV studio. Extra, extra, get your paper here. Latest election returns. Election return? Extra, extra, Herbert Hoover, elected president of the United States. <laughs> Hoover defeats Alfred E. Smith, extra, extra. Herbert Hoover, new president, extra, extra. Hmm. That's what I get for transcribing my show so far in advance. <laughs> oh, well, I better hurry. Good night, folks. Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Rochester, Dennis Day, Bob Crosby, and yours truly, Don Wilson. 
Ladies and gentlemen, last Sunday on his television show, Jack Benny acted both roles in that famous classic, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which was written by Robert Louis Stevenson. That's right. Stevenson took a beating. (laughs) Wait a minute. And here's the star of our show, Jack Benny. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and... Don. Don. 33-dimensional. Don, I want to ask you something about that introduction. Did you write that joke yourself? Well, I don't want to take all the credit. My wife helped me write that one. Oh, your wife. Your wife helped you, eh? Don, she's an actress, isn't she? Jack, you know very well that my wife is an actress. You've had her on your program many times. In fact, she was on just last week. That's right. Don, isn't it a shame that both of you are going to be out of work at the same time? (laughs) I'm sorry you have no children. I'd enjoy firing them, too. Now, wait a minute, Jack. You can't fire me after all the years I've been with you. I started as your announcer in 1934, and during all these 19 years, I've given you loyalty and devotion. Some loyalty and devotion. Every time I cut your salary, you tell everybody. (laughs) Anyway, Don... If you ever cut my salary, my mother would slap your silly face. (laughs) Dennis. Dennis, in the first place, I wasn't talking to you. And in the second place, it's about time you showed up. How come you missed rehearsal today? I had a tooth pulled. Oh. Oh, well, then I'm sorry. Was the tooth giving you a lot of pain, Dennis? No. (laughs) Oh. Did, uh, did it have a cavity? No. Then why in the world did you have your tooth pulled? Because the dentist owed me $10, and that was the only way I could collect... Look, kid, you let the dentist pull your tooth because he owed you $10? Yeah, I wish he owed me 11 Then I could have had Novocaine. <laughs> well, I don't want to go into that anymore. I don't care whether Remley laughs or not. I don't want to go into that. Now, Dennis, look it. I don't mind so much your missing rehearsal. But the least you could have done is let me know. Well, I did. I called your house yesterday, and I told Rochester I couldn't be there. Oh, you did, eh? Well, I'm going to call Rochester and find out. Say, Mabel, what is it, Gertrude? Mr. Benny's line is flashing. Yeah, I wonder what the bat in the pocket full wants now. (laughs) I'll plug in and find out. Hello? Yes, Mr. Benny. Very well, I'll see if I can get him for you. He wants I should ring his house and get him Rochester. Gee, Gertrude, you sound awfully formal when you were speaking to Jack. Uh, Did you two have a fight? No. Uh, In fact, just the other night, he took me to a preview. We saw Rita Hayworth in Salome. It was an exciting picture, especially when Rita did the dance of the seven veils. Gosh, did she take off all seven? No, she stopped when she took off number six. But Jack will never know. (laughs) Why not? He fainted at number five. (laughs) Are you kidding? Jack really fainted? Yeah. He closed those baby blue eyes and slid right off the seat. (laughs) Well, what do you know? Uh, Look, you've been seeing a lot of him lately, haven't you? Yeah. I've been seeing Jack so often I had to turn down a date with Dennis Day last week. Well, look who's talking. Jeannie with the light brown teeth. (laughs) All right. Look, let's not argue. Gertrude. Gertrude. What? Are you sure there's no answer? Well, keep trying the number. Goodbye. What's the matter, Jack? Rochester isn't home. But I'm going to call him again. And Dennis, for your sake, I hope you were telling me the truth. Now, it's time for your song, so let's have it. Yes, sir. Oh, hold it, kid. Come in. 
Uh, a telegram for Jack Benny. <laughs> I'm Jack Benny. Well, here you are. I'll be darned, it's from Fred Allen. Fred Allen? What does he say? Dear Jack, I have just been informed that I am to appear on your television show. That's what I get for telling my agent to get me anything. <laughs> hmm. Now, come on, Dennis. Let's get on with it. The... Boy, what are you hanging around here for? Well, sir, I don't mean to appear impudent or presumptuous, but when someone delivers a telegram, it is customary for the recipient to show his appreciation with a gratuity. <laughs> Okay, okay. Here. Oh, boy, a Canadian dime. Now I can summer at Lake Louise. <laughs> Dennis, let's have your song. That, that was Dennis Day singing for ten. Very good, Dennis. It was excellent. And now, kids, we have a very important play to do tonight. Hey, where's Bob Crosby? Well, here I am. Bob, I just happened to think of something. You missed rehearsal, too. What's your excuse? Well, I had to go down to buy a little gift for Sammy's new baby. Sammy, the drummer's wife, had a baby? Mm -hmm. Gee, I didn't know that. Hey, remind me to send something, too. Eh? Okay. No, it's wonderful the way the presents have been rolling in. All the musicians sent gifts. Gosh, okay. Bagby sent a little blanket. Wayne Songer sent a cute little dress. Rembley sent a sweater that he knitted. And Kimmick sent the nice... Hold it, hold it a second, Bob. Hold it. <laughs> you said Remley sent a sweater he knitted? Yeah. I didn't know Remley could knit. Jack, when you got the shakes like Frankie has, you can do wonders with knitting needles. <laughs> well, I, I, I guess so. After six martinis, he's an Argyle man. <laughs> that figures. Now, kids, it's getting late, and I think we ought to start on the sketch we're going to do. Huh? Uh, what about the sketch, Mr. Benny? Well, it's based on that wonderful universal international picture, Mississippi Gambler. Starring Tyrone Power. I, of course, will play Tyrone Power's part. Wait a minute, Jack. Do you think you're the type? Well... He certainly is. He's young, handsome, and romantic, just like Tyrone Power. Oh, thanks, Dennis. You're loyal and devoted. I'm nuts, too. <laughs> now, cut that out! <laughs> now, Don, set the scene. And we'll... oh, hold it a minute, hold it. Hello? Hello, oh, Mr. Benny, this is Rochester. Rochester, I called you before and you were out. I had to go down to the market to do some shopping for the house. Oh, what'd you get? I got a half pound of hamburger, a can of peas, a can of beans, and a bale of alfalfa. <laughs> Why in the world would you buy a bale of alfalfa? The price of milk went up two cents and I know what you're going to do about that. <laughs> I am not. They don't let they don't let you keep them in Beverly Hills. Pasadena, maybe, but not Beverly Hills. <laughs> now, Rochester, the reason I called is because Dennis Day said he phoned yesterday and told you he'd have to miss rehearsal. Oh, yes, boss. I forgot to tell you. Oh, oh, you did, eh? Well, were there any calls today? Yes, sir. I have them right here. Let's see. The income tax department called. Income tax? What, what do they want? What do they want? Oh, it didn't concern you, boss. It was about the income I reported. Well, what was wrong with it? Nothing. They just called to offer their sympathy. <laughs> well, that's your problem. Were there any other calls? Oh, yes. Miss Barbara Stanwyck called. She's giving a big party tomorrow night, and she wants you to be there. Oh, good, good. Black tie or white tie? White coat, you'll be parking cars. <laughs> oh, well, Rochester, put some new batteries in my flashlight. <laughs> Goodbye, Rochester. Goodbye. <laughs> All right, Don. Now, Don, you can set the scene for our sketch. Okay. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the Playhouse presents its version of Mississippi Gambler. Curtain. Music. In the middle 
middle of the 19th century, the main artery of commerce and transportation between the North and the South was the Mississippi. Riverboats used to paddle their way up and down in a never-ending stream. Aboard these ships was cargo and passengers, and a special breed of these passengers was the Mississippi Gambler. My name is Tyrone Benny. I'm a Mississippi Gambler, and I've been going up and down this river all my life. The first 20 years were tough. Then I got on a boat. (laughs) I don't remember much of my father, but my mother was a kindly woman. She always tried to teach me right from wrong. I remember when I was two years old. She sat me on her lap and said, Look, son, you're very young, but try to remember this. Never draw to an inside straight. relationship. But when I was 18, mother and I parted. I went to New Orleans, and she went to Tehachapi. <laughs> One day, my best friend, Robert Stonewall Crosby, and I found ourselves in St. Paul, and we boarded a riverboat back to New Orleans. <laughs> You think we'll make any money this trip, Tyrone? Sure, there are plenty of suckers aboard. But, Bob, I don't know whether you're ready to be a professional gambler yet. Well, why not? Well, you don't keep a good poker face. Well, what makes you say that? Because I've watched you. When you fill a full house, you're supposed to sit there with a vacant expression. Not jump up on your chair and sing two choruses of Oh, Happy Day. Wait a minute. Here comes a couple of guys that look ripe for picking. Let me do the talking. Would you gentlemen care to while away the time in a friendly game of cards? Well, I don't mind if I do. I got a thousand dollars I can spare. And I got a Canadian dime. (laughs) You got your tip. Get out of here. Now, come on. We'll play some three-handed poker. Well, suits me. Here's the table. I'll deal. Hmm. I'll open for fifty dollars. I'll see that and raise it a hundred. I'll see your raise and raise it another hundred. That's too much for me. I'm out. Well, I'll call. Give me two cards. I'll take one. I'll bet a hundred dollars. I'll raise two hundred. Well, I'll just call. What do you got? Four aces. Beats me. I got three aces. <laughs> That's why I dropped out. I only had two. <laughs> Wait a minute, stranger. You dealt those nine aces, and I think you're cheating. No man can say that to me, sir. Do you know what it means when someone slaps your face with his glove? It means a challenge to a duel. That's right, so take that. I accept your challenge. <laughs> However, duels were small incidents on the river, and our boat pushed south. Our ride took us down past Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois, and then Missouri. (laughs) Oh, that isn't who you think, folks. The trip continued. Every night I played poker, and I always won. One night, the captain caught me cheating. And as punishment, he tied a rope around me and kept dipping me in and out of the river. He thought it was a treat to beat my feet on the Mississippi mud. It was shortly after this incident that I met her. I remember when we 
Oliver were first introduced, she said, I am awfully glad to meet you, monsieur. And I hope you and I can become good friends. Very good friends. Her name was Yvette. And she had come aboard that morning at Albuquerque. Now, I know that Albuquerque is far from the Mississippi. But for her, somehow the boat made it. I told her that I, too, hoped we would become good friends. And she said... You are very kind, monsieur. She was a plain gal. (laughs) Slim, frail, and immature. (laughs) This description was written before the part was cast. (laughs) We fell in love. But because her brother hated gamblers, we had to meet each other secretly. One morning after we landed at New Orleans, she was supposed to meet me at the place where I lived, the Old Man River Hotel. It was called the Old Man River Hotel because when you stayed there, you were tired of living and feared of dying. (laughs) While waiting for her, I thought I'd have some breakfast and call room service. Soon the waiter was knocking at my door. Come in. I had that you call for room service. <laughs> yes, I want some breakfast. Orange juice, coffee, and uh, let's see, what can I have with the coffee? Well, we have toast, English muffins, donuts, and Cimarron rolls. <laughs> what? Cimarron rolls. Look, waiter, bring me some orange juice, coffee, and a Cimarron roll. <laughs> Okay, and you're lucky. Yesterday, I couldn't have brought you any cinnamon rolls. Why not? We were out of cinnamon. <laughs> All right, just go get it. <laughs> he brought me my breakfast, and I finished it. And then Yvette arrived. She looked so beautiful standing there in her new knitted dress. I could tell it was newly knitted because a drunken guitar player was still working on it. <laughs> Now, darling, you're here, you're here. Oh, yes, Jerome. I'm sorry to be late, but I Don't had... talk. Just come into my arms. Now, let me kiss you. Oh, oh, your kiss. It is so wonderful. It tastes of Cimarron. <laughs> Cimarron? That's French for cinnamon. (laughs) Oh, then I must apologize to the waiter. Who can that be? Oh, it must be my brother. He followed me here. Hey, wait a minute. Ah, monsieur, at last I have found you. You pig, you dog, you snake. I break you in two. Oh, then is my brother. Listen to me. Eh. Oh, j'aime cet homme. Il est moi. Et quoi qu'il est un joueur comme du fleuve, et nous sommes des aristocraties, je lui marierai sans égard pour qu'elle te dise. What did she say? I do not know, but dig that crazy language. <laughs> now look. Monsieur, my sister will not marry your gambler. I challenge you to a duel. What? I slap your face with my glove. You're supposed to take your hand out of it first. <laughs> but if you want a duel, draw your sword. On guard. <laughs> I thought he'd be an easy victim. He was so young, so inexperienced. But as the duel progressed, the minutes wore on and on till we had fought an hour. Still we fought on with unabated fury, and another hour passed. And another hour. Then suddenly it was over. He didn't hurt me, and I didn't harm him. But my two sound men killed each other. (laughs) That is my story. The Adventures of a Mississippi.
ਲਈ ਕਹਿ